Good morning. I'd like to welcome you guys to um, the 15th Annual Di Dean's Diversity Forum. I am Ingrid Mars as Osorio. I'm the president of LALSA here at Widener. So I'm just going to go through um, a little bit of what Widener is and kind of um, just what we do and what we're trying to do here at Widener. So I am a 3L student. I took over as president for LALSA at the beginning of my last year. Um, because we were remote because of COVID, LALSA had kind of tapered off because it was kind of difficult for us to do anything on campus. So one of the biggest things and the biggest challenges we had was reviving all of the organizations and kind of bringing diversity back onto the campus. Um, so that has been our main focus. But uh, LALSA stands for La Latino American Law Students Association. It's an org that's run by us students um, and we just come together. We like to discuss different issues that are affecting the Latino community, um, law, stu law students in general. And our goal overall is just to provide support and guidance to non-traditional students. By non-traditional, we not only are saying um, students that waited to go to law school, uh, but first-generation students, um, students that don't have support at home, that have parents that either don't speak the language, um, don't understand what it's like being in law school, don't understand what it's like even going to undergrad, things like that. And we like to just be able to foster kind of a group that they can feel comforted, supported, and understood. And so that's just basically our goal. And then to carry them friendships and that stability on to after graduation. Cool. So like I said, um, LOSS is committed to increasing the awareness of the Latin American culture, um, not only here on campus, but just in our surroundings in general. Um, one of the things that we do like to do with um, just creating awareness is just making our presence known and just understanding that we can kind of point each other out and know that there's somebody else here that understands what you're going through. And not only that, but help those that don't come from the Latin American culture and background, just kind of understand us better. And I feel like once you foster those conversations and you are able to understand the other person that's with you in a room, it creates a better relationship overall. So we do like to make law so open, not only to Latin American students, but all students that wanna come and join and just ask us questions, hang out with us, and just anything like that. So just some basic facts, um, only 4% of attorneys in the United States are of the Latino origin. Um, Underrepresentation overall in law school, out of the top 30 schools, only 9% of those students are Latino and out of the low ranking schools, only 23% of them are of the Hispanic or Latino origin. So there aren't that many Hispanic or Latino attorneys and that's one of the things that we are also working towards, right? Law school is difficult. And how do you get through a difficult process when you don't have somebody else that you feel that you can connect with and relate to on a more personal level? So part of succeeding in law school and bringing that diversity is finding that core group and just kind of helping each other through everything that we go through in law school. Um, some of the things that we do do on campus, we have been trying to do community outreach. Our community outreach this year or this semester were Easter baskets. We're collecting Easter baskets for a nonprofit and then uh, that works with foster children and then we'll be taking those Easter baskets and dropping them off. We do salsa nights um, once a month where we come together. We have an instructor that teaches us how to dance salsa virtually. And we do that over at the, uh, I call it like not the pit, but it used to be like an old cafe up at the top on the hill. So we hang out there. Um, and then afterwards, we just kind of stay around, talk, and just have fun. Um, we do celebrate various Hispanic holidays and cultures. We did celebrate like Day of the Dead. Um, we did um, celebrate women in history and kind of highlight different women in the Latino community that are part of women's history and have done things like that. And then we do have an event called Espresso and Espires, or we've named it uh, Cafecito with a Judge, which Cafecito is just Spanish for coffee. Um, if you know the Spanish community, we are big on coffee. We live off of it. <laughs> so Espresso and Esquires just allows us, again, to bring in um, attorneys and judges of different diversity backgrounds to just talk to our students, right, and let them know their experience in law school, their experience after law school, and just, again, kind of foster that relationship so that you have that once you leave law school and you have somebody else to connect with. So that's uh, Law School Wagner. <laughs> yep. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Avery Mars, and I'm a first year student and the 1L representative for BOLSA here on campus, and that is Black Law Students Association. BOLSA is committed to raising awareness around um, professional needs and goals of Black students. Um, we have a lot of events that we also hold that we've actually been able to do last semester on campus after COVID, which was great. Um, we've donated to local food drives. We've been able to hold different panels with diverse attorneys. Um, we're actually going to have a field day at the end of this semester, which we're really excited about. So students, please look forward to that. Um, and I think we are also taking part in the Espresso um, and Esquires as well with Lulsa, which is nice to join organizations together. Uh, currently our president, Neoma Embe, and a few other of our e-board members are in Washington, DC to support the historical nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, which is great that they're able to support the national organization and also Judge Jackson today. Um, and it is also my honor to be able to introduce the Dean of Weiner Law Commonwealth. Uh, dean Michael J. Hussey has previously served as the law school's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and co-director of the campus's business advising program, which he founded. As a faculty director, Dean Hussey continues to lead the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program where students and alumni prepare tax returns for low to moderate income taxpayers. Dean Alsi is also on the United Way of the Capital Region's Board of Directors and is a former recipient of the Central Penn Business Journal's 40 Under 40 designation. As a professor, Dean Hussey teaches and writes in the areas of taxation, business organizations, wills, trusts, and estate planning, and previously received the Teacher of the Year Award. Dean Hussey graduated magna cum laude from St. Louis University School of Law and received an LLM in taxation from Washington University School of Law. Thank you, Dean Hussey. Thank you all for being here. Those of you who are with us on campus and those of you that have joined us on Zoom, it's wonderful to have such a great group gathered together for this annual Dean's Diversity Forum to talk about um, the, uh, the great topic that we have here today about our children's education and what it bodes for the future of all of us in, in all of that. So I'm really delighted, really delighted about the great speakers we have assembled today. Our first speaker is the Honorable Representative Joanna McClinton. She is the House Democratic leader for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, the first woman to be elected to serve in that capacity in the House's 244 year history. Previously in 2018, Representative McClinton also made history when she became the first woman and the first African American to be elected as a House Democratic Caucus Chair. She represents uh, first elected to the State House in 2015, she represents communities in West and Southwest Philadelphia, as well as Yedden and Darby and Delaware County. Representative McClinton is a lifelong resident of Southwest Philly and is a graduate of Grace Temple Christian Academy, LaSalle University, and Villanova University School of Law. She has been honored by numerous organizations for her service, including receiving the Barristers Association of Philadelphia's outstanding Young Lawyer of the Year Award, the Pre-K for PA Champion Award, the Lucian E. Blackwell Guiding Light Community Award. She is also regarded by her colleagues in the House as an innovative and zealous leader for educational reform in Pennsylvania. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Representative Joanna McClinton. Thank you for that warm welcome. Good morning, everybody. It is so great to be here for this very important conversation, discussion, and for all the lawyers, CLE credits. <laughs> but I am so excited. I was just truly honored to hear from the presidents of LULSA and BALSA. It was not that long ago um, that I was um, not at your school, but sitting in your seat as a member of the BALSA community um, as the vice president my 2L year. And I don't think I had an office third year, but you know, those things, some of them we wipe out of our memories. <laughs> because they are such a joyous journey. But I'm thrilled to be with you this morning and to talk about our children's success is our monument.
document the impacts of legislation. And I hope that there is time for us to engage and have a couple of questions uh, that I can answer or recommendations as we go back to Harrisburg. We have session again next Tuesday. I would love to hear from those in the virtual audience and of course those who are at the law school. So the theme of our children's success will be our monument. Um, the question is, what kind of a monument do we want to build for our children? Uh, what kind of monument do we want to leave for our children? Uh, we know that monuments, uh, they're symbols of pride, they're treasures, they represent a community's values, um, they have significance. And the idea that we can literally view children's success as a monument, that is just amazing to me. Um, children, in fact, are, are our living monuments. They are our legacy, they are our future. So it is very important in how we treat them, how we educate them, how we prepare them for the world that, that awaits in their future, and how we show them that society, in fact, values them, um, similar to actual monuments in our nation's capital or in different parts um, of the country or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, monuments have to be taken care of. And our children have to be taken care of. They have to be put in the best environments. They have to be uh, provided education and, and well-funded schools. And they need environments that support their talents, recognize their needs, and offer opportunities for their growth and their development. As as a lawmaker in Harrisburg, addressing the needs of how we fund our children's education, how our teachers are um, you know, compensated, and how our students are provided healthy environments, it is a very important key uh, for our legislative fight in Harrisburg, um, making sure that we have laws in place to put quality education for all. Um, our Constitution uh, provides for an equal protection clause. You all know that better than I do at this point. Um, the 14th Amendment says that uh, when a state establishes a public school, that no child living in that state can be denied equal access um, to schooling. However, our Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, does not say in our constitution what that access to education looks like. It simply says that we should provide a thorough and fair um, education. And uh, years ago, one of the classes I took at Villanova Law School was on um, the disparities of school funding in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, it was education and the law, but we focused on the disparities. And it was the first time in my life as um, a law student to actually see the numbers, see the numbers that are spent, um, for instance, in Montgomery County suburb of Lower Marion, um, then just a mile away to Philadelphia School District, to see the disparities is just staggering. And that was in uh, like 04, 05. Um, and, you know, you fast forward it to 2022, and we still have those disparities. We still have some school districts where children have opportunities and other school districts where it's kind of a... Uh, good luck. We're telling our children good luck. And that to me is absolutely unacceptable. Um, when you think about landmark decisions, like the uh, United States Supreme Court decision, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, um, it declared that, you know, separate education does not um, have to mean an equal education. And as a result, um, they had to provide uh, better experiences for children of color who were segregated and deprived, who didn't have access to books, who didn't have access to resources in their classrooms. And they, in fact, told the school districts that they needed to uh, provide integration because that was the best way for our children to have access to equal resources. And despite um, that decision, when you uh, fast forward uh, 50 plus years since that decision, we still see almost um, the same type of separate um, education. We see children of color, communities of color, receiving one type of education, especially those who are in lower income statuses. And then we see people who have um, the wealth, the means, the access, Paying able, able to pay uh, higher property taxes, able to provide their children um, in the public school system a much higher education. And I heard the statistics that the law president shared about how few Latina lawyers there are um, in our country. And I know that um, as we all watch Washington, D.C. right now, um, interviewing and hopefully getting to a confirmation very soon for Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson, I know that um, when I think about my education, 
education and my school district where I came from and my mom deciding, okay, well, I'm not going to send you to this school. I'm going to work a second job so that you can go to a private school because I don't trust that you're going to get the best education. And it's like, it's one thing for people to make that decision decades ago, but for parents to still have to be making these tough choices, it is just not fair. Um, so we have to do everything possible to make sure that our children are those monuments, that we have uh, all the systems in place so that our districts that are in urban and poorer districts and even in rural districts that are poorer as well, that they are able to provide their children the great education that suburban students receive, um, policies that are associated with the school funding of our children of color it means a lot. I went to a high school last week and some of the students were saying, you know, we would like to have an art room where we can just not do art class, but we have access to express ourselves artistically, where we can paint, where we can draw. Um, one of the other students said, I'm on the basketball team and I don't feel enough school pride when I go onto my court and we go and play in other schools and their school has their name and, you know, not lights, but just painted nicely and ours is bad and our our uh, backboards are broken. We're seeing issues, um, and to this day, where our children do not feel like they are the ones who should be the monuments because they are not getting the support they need. They're in larger classes. Um, they don't have access to a high quality curriculum. And we know what the end results are. They bring inequalities. And as a former assistant public defender in the city of Philadelphia, I can just say firsthand how many of my former clients would say, oh, you know, I love school. Why did you leave school? Well, you go to the school, the school's dilapidated, the school, you know, doesn't appear to have the resources necessary for you to learn. It's not teaching you what you need to be learning. So you decide, I'm not valued here. I'm not a part of um, society. So I'm going to go and, and make my own way. I don't feel like I'm a part of what's going on here. And that should be, that should never be. It is absolutely unsuccessful, uh, um, un, excuse me, unacceptable. What we are trying to do in Harrisburg, and one of the things that I don't get tired of talking about is that if we are not successfully educating all of our children, how will their success ever serve us, all of us, as our monuments? Um, we see the disparity amongst the Pennsylvania's wealthy and poor districts, and it, it creates inequities, not just as children, but for your future. <laughs> it creates inequities for your future. If you are dropping out of high school, the statistics nationally is you will earn $1 million less because you do not do not complete your high school education. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. The good news is, as I said, we're still fighting for this. Um, the governor's budget proposal will be going into budget season this spring and into the month of June. Um, wants to uh, allocate $300 million to Pennsylvania's 100 most underfunded school districts. But all I'm asking for when we have these conversations, because we did 100 million last year to the 100 most, is let's expand that number. Let's expand to the 200 most underfunded school districts so that we can boost the money they get through the funding formula. And that would be tremendous. It would really help. It would really deliver. It would really provide a better opportunity for our children across the Commonwealth. And this is the type of thing that is driving my career and encouraging me um, to be able to fight in Harrisburg. But we need everybody. We want to have the outcomes that are equitable. We want to have access that is fair. And we don't want to have these disparities just continue to be on in our history. It's one thing for me to learn about this in the classroom 15 years ago, but for this to still be the reality, it is absolutely not okay. The good news also is that our state Supreme Court had been hearing a case on school funding that has taken several years, of course, to get to the court and in front of it for oral arguments. But they heard testimony from superintendents from all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, from rural communities, from urban communities, from suburban communities that are smaller and a little bit more challenged financially, talking about how this is unfair, this is inequitable, and how this is unacceptable. So one of the things that I want to close with, and hopefully you'll have the opportunity to engage a little bit should there be time, is simply that we must continue to, to show that our children can be monuments. And the only way we can make their success a monument is by determining what type of monument we're trying to build and how are we going to make sure that there's a legacy um, for these children and that legacy can be demonstrated in their success for today. Because if they have opportunities to be successful today, they will have opportunities, of course, to be successful tomorrow and one day be in your law school and another medical school and so many other advanced educational opportunities. Thank you.
Thank you, Representative McClinton. Um, so at this point, I'd like to uh, throw it open to see if we have any questions for the representative. Yes. Whether or not the leader could speak on the role of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus in advancing these education issues before the General Assembly. All right. So the question is whether um, uh, Representative McClinton could speak about the role of the Black Legislative Caucus in advancing these issues before the legislature. Absolutely. So I uh, have been a member of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus since um, I was elected in 2015 and was very actively engaged with them when I was a chief counsel to my state senator um, two years prior to running for the, this opportunity in the House. And they also uh, lay out budget priorities, uh, presenting them to the governor. And they also, um, of course, actively advocate for issues um, on an ongoing basis, uh, talking about priorities um, that are wide ranging. One of the things that um, recently our current Black Caucus Chair is Representative Donna Bullock. She's another attorney in the House and uh, she spent a lot of her years in public interest um, and before running for the House. And one of her uh, big fights has been for um, the ability to have a, a equitable state budget that benefits communities of color um, whether we're talking about housing, whether we're talking about school funding, whether we're talking about funding for violence prevention programs, they have a several uh, arch uh, agenda that they're often advocating for. Um, thank you. We have a few um, questions that have come in um, in the in the chat, and so I will. Um, share those with you. And I, I should have mentioned I appreciate it so that everybody can hear. I'll repeat the questions even the, from the ones in the room so that on Zoom and all of that, it's not that uh, your question wasn't clear. I just wanted to make sure that we could all um, hear. But um, uh, one of our participants notes that um, they attended a terribly underfunded high school in Northumberland County and so understands where you're going with this. Um, but something that's always confused this person is why we simply don't distribute these property taxes more evenly. Is there no legislative taste at all for that sort of equity? And why, if that's the case? So I think the question there is, why do we do it more evenly? Yes, so there's not a good answer that makes sense in my perspective. Because to me, if we want to have an amazing Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, if we want to have you know, great lawyers, doctors, uh, health, home health aides uh, in the future, we want to uh, provide all of our children the best education possible now, particularly when we have uh, money in the budget to do so, and when we're able to uh, do a ton of good work through uh, putting every dollar in the fair funding formula. So in terms of why and what the opposition looks like, it's a uh, multifaceted. Um, one of the elements of opposition is people who believe public dollars should go to private education. The people who believe in vouchers, I'm sure that is something that is not unfamiliar to this crowd. Um, folks who believe that our tax dollars should be able to be a tuition um, check to go wherever you'd like to go. Uh, there are other people who believe um, in the community of charter operators that um, you know, fairly funded schools would potentially diminish the number of students attending charter schools, um, which often are shiny and newer and fresh paint, um, some of which, and I'm not disparaging them, provide a really excellent education. But unfortunately, I've seen many with numbers who are the children are not learning how to read. So that is a problem. Um, and then there's others who just see their school districts as winning. So each of us run, we, we run for election, we um, you know, ask our neighbors to, to get a district who's doing really well, then why am I going to uh, shake the apple cart um, for children I don't know whose parents can't vote for me? So then there's sometimes just the self-preservation uh, of that's not my district, that's not my problem. Um, but to my uh, understanding and in my perspective as a lawmaker um, for the whole state, you know, yes, we have individual districts with individual needs. Um, we need to be able to say that this is a problem for all of us if our children in Northumberland and William Penn School District, um, you know, in Monroe County, 
County, if they are not getting an education, that's all of our problem. And then the final one I'll mention is people who um, work very hard uh, or, you know, have access to, to much more financial wealth um, think, you know, it's not my problem to take care of children elsewhere. I work hard. I have a good income. I get to live wherever I live and pay an enormous amount of property taxes so that my children can go to uh, you know, one of the blue ribbon top tiered high schools in the state for free. Uh, so it's, it's a variety of different forms of opposition. Thank you. Other questions? Representative, I'll ask, um, I mean, you had talked about $100 million for 100 schools. Um, that seems like an incredibly small amount. Um, what's the sense of what the, the true, what the need is? I mean, what will we need to fix this problem to make our funding um, what it needs to be to provide the education that students are entitled to? Yes, $100 million is not what uh, will suffice in terms of like, uh, the first thing we have as a problem is that the governor created a basic education commission uh, in his first term, I want to say 2015, and um, they made recommendations of the only way for us to get out of this really inequitable system is for every single dollar to go through the funding formula. The funding formula takes into account, for instance, how many English language learners are in your classrooms, um, how many special education students are in your classrooms, um, you know, and then other costs that vary and they all have a different weight. Um, but unfortunately, there was not the political will um, to, you know, really, have the appetite to do the right thing and send every one of those dollars through the formula. So what we've been doing is, you know, nibbling at a very large apple to try to get to the core. Um, but we need, you know, at least uh, $1 billion to be able to start and just send the dollars that we already send straight through. The other thing that we have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is something called hold harmless. And that's another reason why some people oppose fairly funding every school, because some districts have received the same amount of money, and I'm not exaggerating, for a minimum of 20 to 25 years, um, some of them for more. And it does not matter how many students there are, if it increase or decrease. And the ones who have, you know, extra money from the state, they don't want to get rid of the whole harmless. They want to say, we want to keep that money because we can use it for a brand new building or we can use it to enhance what we already have. And the final example I'll give on this question is when I came into the legislature, there was a budget impasse uh, because the state budget had not passed by the June 2015 deadline and that I was elected in August. So I go from, you know, working in the Senate where my member was the whip and I was in budget discussions to being a member of the House and we, there was just seeming to be no movement on the state budget. And one of my colleagues that we would have these lunches and just try to get to know each other, she shared, oh, you know, I'm a former school board director and I won't say where she's from uh, because it wasn't a public discussion. She said, and we don't even need the state's money. We just use that for cushion. So imagine there are school districts in our state that don't even need what the, what the Commonwealth sends them. They don't even need our tax dollars because they have enough from their own tax base to pay for their expenses and to provide their children a good education. So it is, um, you know, absolutely unbelievable. I was just like, what? What do you mean? I said, well, why don't you give it back? I said, I serve children in Delaware County um, who need this money. Like, if you don't need it, you should just, you know, we were talking about all the fallout from the budget. And she said, oh, well, I was a school board director in my area for years, and we don't even need that money. All right, thank you. A uh, question from Randy. Um, uh, talk about if a, a high school junior high student were to come to you and ask you how your experience of education ultimately contributed to your success, what would you, what would you encourage them to try and get out of their education so that, that they can be successful? So Professor Lee's question is if a junior high or a high school student came to you and asked you how education contributed to your success. What did you get out of your education that has led you to where you are now? What would you tell that student? 
Thank you for the question. So I would tell the junior high or high school student to um, absolutely get prepared. And I visit schools in my district rather regularly. And one of the things I explain to them is it doesn't you know, happen when you get to 11th grade. It doesn't happen when you are junior in college. Like we always, as young people, I don't think our children are given expectations enough um, and I don't mean, you know, necessarily from their teachers, but sometimes it's at home. And the best motivation I ever had was my mom. <laughs> you know, it was literally just the best motivation of, oh, no, well, you're going to do this and you're going to get these types of grades and you're going to succeed. So I try to encourage our children to set metrics for themselves because there comes a point and they're very young and they're growing um, that they have to look themselves in the mirror and say, I'm giving this my all. I'm doing everything I can so that success is inevitably in my future. I am working hard. I'm doing my work. I'm not just slouching. I'm not, you know, being influenced by the crowds and really talking to them about the pressure sometimes to not um, succeed and to, to just be, you know, showing up and be haphazard with our, with our life and to take ownership of our life. Because some of the children that I talk to on a regular basis have so many grown up problems and challenges and trauma. So I have to talk to them in a way that motivates and education educates them, but is also realistic at balancing the things that they are facing and dealing with on a regular basis, dealing with so much trauma and in being encouraged that they can move forward in their lives, that they can if they haven't seen any witnesses about how it benefits you doing well in junior high or high school, like I'm gonna be one of them. I didn't start doing well when I got an acceptance letter to law school. Like you have to start in high school. You have to start in junior high school. You have to start, you know, whatever grade you're in. So I make an effort to really uh, be clear and be transparent about that. Thank you. Um, so we've had some questions come in as well um, and through the chat here. Um, and so one relates to, um, is the school funding formula enough or do we need a more holistic approach that um, accounts for the needs of the students outside of the classroom? So because we haven't sent every dollar through the school funding formula, I'm going to say that is a huge start. That would be a big start at addressing, um, you know, larger communal needs. Obviously, it won't be as uh, individualized, but it's a huge start. If we could get um, a every single one of our taxpayer dollars through that formula sent out to our districts, that would be a significant start and really, really help those districts who are um, often underfunded. Because when we look at districts that are underfunded, there are factors that go along there, like working class, like impoverishment. Um, <laughs> and then we know all the symptoms of, you know, working class and poverty, uh, whether we're talking about violence or opioid epidemics. I mean, there's so many different issues, social issues that plague um, along with what determines um, your, your uh, financial class, which determines what type of school funding you have based on the amount of property taxes you're able to afford. So if we could start by sending every single dollar through those formulas to make our schools better, welcoming, and letting children know you are the monument we're building. You are the one we're investing in. There's hope for your future because look around you. Don't you want to come in here and learn? Um, that to me would be the biggest start. Thank you. Um, another question here from um, our participants on Zoom, and it relates to uh, or ask about whether we need to fundamentally restructure how we fund education. And so it notes that um, by and large, the funding is based on property tax, um, which reinforces um, historic patterns of housing segregation um, and that effect on the education funding equity. And then wonder, should we fund that um, based on the income tax? Um, are there other alternatives that would allow students to enroll across district lines um, so that um, they could, um, in theory, choose the schools that they want to attend? So I throw that out for your response, Representative. Should we fundamentally change how we fund? So I don't think we need to fundamentally change how we fund. I just think we need to fund the schools fairly. Um, Pennsylvania continues to be ranked towards the bottom um, of our nation. And as I was saying, you know, when I took education law in Nova in 04, 05, whenever it was, um, 
it was the same type of ranking and assessment. And we, as a result, haven't seen different outcomes. I'd like to give it a chance to actually do um, what, you know, at least Governor Wolf has been pledged to doing um, for almost eight, full eight years now, which is to, you know, give every child in their area a school that, that is going to provide them a great education. I think we can do it. And I think that if we do it, um, we don't need to recreate in another type of wheel. We have a wheel with spokes on it, but we just <laughs> haven't gotten it, the ball rolling. Great. Thank you. Um... Let's see. Um, so what um, uh, strategies do you think might um, help raise greater public awareness and further the process on these issues? So some of the strategies that have been implemented thus far include um, a lot of tremendous civic groups. Um, they come up to the Capitol, uh, they, they talk about these issues. Um, there are so many different advocates that, that write op-eds that um, make this a big discussion. And I think that um, there was a lot of solid solidarity, you know, in uh, prior administration before Wolf, when there was a humongous uh, cut to schools. Um, people were really united and fighting towards getting those funds restored. And while those funds have since been restored after suffering through those cuts, um, we you know, continue to see people coming together and, and making this a priority. Um, the challenge in certain school districts is if um, you know, parents are, uh, you know, less active, vocal, organized. They need other people to be um, on the mission and on the ground speaking up for them. So for some, this may not be something that impacts you directly. Potentially, you live in a well-funded school district, and this is not an issue. But if this outrages you, there is a role for you to play. There is something for you to do. There is a way that you can get plugged in and participate in this advocacy process. And every single one of our voices is needed. Okay. Professor Kogan. There are 500 school districts in Pennsylvania, and that means that there are 500 superintendents and probably 1,000 assistant superintendents. Might some fairer funding be realized if the state encouraged more regionalization of school districts as opposed to the small local school districts that we have now? And wouldn't regional school districts potentially produce fair funding if they included both poor and richer areas? So the question um, is that we have approximately 500 school districts in Pennsylvania. So we have 500 superintendents and um, at least a thousand assistants that might be low in my uh, experience um, and all of that. Um, but with that, um, you know, in our 67 counties, we have, you know, 500 school districts. Would we be in a better position if we had more regional school districts? So we had larger districts, we consolidated. Would that help, in your estimation, remove some of the um, inequities in funding because we would have um, rich and more rich and poor areas combined into one school district? So absolutely, I think that that makes, you know, totally uh, practical sense in the terms of reducing overhead expenses and collaborating ideas and uh, because what we, we can continue to go down through those costs um, from, you know, actual school administration to school buses, uh, <laughs> you know, something we can all relate to and, and see. I think it makes total sense. And um, by having so many autonomous districts, it is a, a bigger weight to, bur uh, to bear for the Commonwealth, for the entire state. Um, the only challenge I would see, and um, of course the hesitancy is every municipality, um, and we have a Commonwealth with thousands of municipalities um, and uh, thousands of boroughs and townships, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody wants their autonomy and their school name and their 
uh, you know, school flag and their, uh, you know, school motto. So, you know, while it's a little trivial as we have this conversation high level, um, once you get on the ground, people are uh, just, you know, like, well, my school district, we're the, you know, the Joanna Township Bears. We don't want to let that go. <laughs> and as a result, there's a reluctancy. And of course, as I was just sharing a little bit ago, areas that are doing very well don't see the need to do that because they have what they need. And there's a reason why they sacrifice and work and, and move into areas intentionally so that they can have access um, to some of the better school districts and they don't wanna see that diminished. Um, but it is an excellent point, thank you. All right, we have one more question and we have to wrap this up. Thanks for joining us this morning. I have a question uh, regarding uh, looking at this internationally. If you look at the global markets right now, um, Everything is becoming more competitive uh, with uh, American students compared to students maybe in China or India. My nieces are in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and they're in the STEM program. And my brother intentionally put them in uh, the STEM program to make sure that they had access and the capabilities of learning sciences, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Is this, a con is this a concentration that the educational program in Pennsylvania is being addressed or am I asking a question right now that we're well beyond that? We're just talking about basically funding schools or is this program something that kids should be learning today outside of just the fundamental, fundamental rudimentary reading and writing? So the question involves the international competition that our current students will face. And um, the, the question notes that uh, his nieces are in the Washington, D.C. area or school district, and in the STEM program down there is a deliberate effort to be uh, to learn more deeply. And is that something that we should be doing uh, more of in our Pennsylvania schools to make our students more ready for the global marketplace? Yes, thank you for that question. I definitely agree that um, STEM, STEAM, um, it definitely um, needs to be incorporated into core curriculum, but also in uh, extracurricular opportunities. And the other uh, critique that our, our school systems get generally is that our curriculum caters um, towards, you know, the state uh, assessments of our students. And because that is not you know, one of the big uh, highlighted issues or topics, I should say, um, of testing, the emphasis on uh, STEM or STEAM in some areas um, just depends on the school board's decision. Um, it's not something that's coming down from Harrisburg. Um, about three weeks ago in the elementary school, like outside my house, basically, it's in the, the next block, um, we were able to have, um, for the last day of Black History Month, a like fully immersion uh, STEM program uh, where it's children basically it was like a drone camp um, for an hour for several classes at this elementary school by my home. Um, but you know, the children were thrilled, like some of them have flown drones in their personal time, some of them, um, their parents own one or two, or they've seen them, they've, they've participated, but the energy, the excitement was tremendous. Uh, I simply um, followed up with those folks to see how we can get that into more schools. And I was glad to know that at least um, in my school district where I live, that they have been meeting with the administration trying to make this a part of high school education, um, because we have to get there. You know, we can't just think that our children are going to, to go to certain uh, institutions and just be competitive for certain jobs. Like it is very specialized. And what the person who was teaching the class was telling me that for some of the drone pilots, um, you don't even have to have advanced education, um, but the immersion in these types of camps and, and being a drone cadet can get you a job right out of high school. So um, that to me was exciting and provides a, a kind of a small uh, bird's eye view into jobs of the future. Thank you. And please join me in thanking Representative McClinton for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker here. Uh, there we go. Uh, Laura Sparks. 
Uh, Laura recently began her sixth year as the 13th president of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art, the first woman to hold this position. President Sparks is a recognized leader in higher education, finance, community economic development, and uh, philanthropy. And under her leadership, Cooper has stabilized tuition costs, increased scholarships, launched capital improvements, expanded academic programs, and reestablished itself as a place where New Yorkers and the larger virtual community can encounter creative and thought-provoking program that is free and open to the public. President Sparks serves as the vice chair of the Commission on Independent Colleges and Universities in New York, and as the chair of the Association of Independent Technological Universities. She was recently nominated by the Acting Secretary of the Air Force to serve in the Air and Space Force Civic Leaders Program, which will advise the Secretary of the Air Force, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the Chief of Space Operations, and the Air and Space Force's senior leaders. Previously, President Sparks served as the Executive Director of the William Penn Foundation, a $2 billion private foundation dedicated to improving the quality of Philadelphia. Under President Sparks' leadership, the foundation launched and refined its strategic priorities, focusing its $115 million annual grant budget on improvements in the urban education for economically disadvantaged children. She earned a BA in philosophy from Wellesley College, a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and her MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. President Sparks, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Dean Hussey, and, and my thanks also to Professor Randy Lee for the generous invitation to join you today. I'm, I'm really honored to be participating in this conversation. For those of you who don't um, know us, the Cooper Union is a small private college in New York City with distinguished academic schools of architecture, art, and engineering, and that's all complemented by a shared exploration of the humanities and social sciences. We steward a legacy of being a free center of learning in many ways. Until 2014, Cooper Union provided full tuition scholarships for all undergraduates. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot this morning already about the cost of education. And so um, it, I think it should be obvious sort of why that's important. But for us, it was really part of our founding vision because um, Peter Cooper, who founded the school essentially on the eve of the Civil War, believed that a high quality education should really be available to everyone. Um, he actually had less than a year of formal schooling himself, but he was a constant inventor and an entrepreneur and he became a very wealthy man and always wanted for working class people what he never had access to, which was a high quality education. I think he sort of looked around in his day and, and was incredibly frustrated that working class people didn't have access to the Harvards and the Yales of the world. And so he really set about to create a school that was, in his words, equal to the best for working class people. Um, and it was free. He made it free for all of its students and, and was that way, um, as was said in the introduction, for almost uh, for over 150 years. And then um, in 2014, Cooper Union, I think, came to the realization um, prior to my arrival that it really couldn't sustain that financial model anymore. Like lots of other colleges and universities across the country, costs had really escalated. Um, the costs of capital improvements, the costs of healthcare, pension costs, and revenues just couldn't keep pace. And so um, the school introduced a partial tuition model in 2014. Um, which caused quite a stir in our community. And I'm really pleased to say that we are now midway through a 10 year plan to return to the, that model of providing full tuition scholarships for all students so that education is really accessible to anyone regardless of financial means. We've also had a longstanding tradition of hosting free public programming in our historic Great Hall since 1858. Um, even a year before the school opened, Peter Cooper opened the Great Hall, which at the time was the largest public gathering place in Manhattan, um, and always meant for it to be a destination for civic, in, civic debate, 
civic organizing, civic engagement. Um, this is where Abraham Lincoln gave his famous right makes might speech. He was relatively unknown at the time um, and argued in the Great Hall against the expansion of slavery and effectively launched his bid to the presidency. Um, Frederick Douglass spoke in the Great Hall five times. Uh, Susan B. Anthony used to rent an office on the second floor of our building and she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton would go downstairs and organize and advocate for a woman's right to vote. It's where some of the earliest mass feminist meetings took place. Um, some of the earliest meetings to form the NAACP took place in the Great Hall. So we're really um, both steeped in this incredibly rich legacy of social justice and also have a current urgent priority about respond, about returning to a full tuition scholarship model um, for our students. And all of those reasons, our, our legacy and our current priorities are why I was particularly compelled when I learned about the theme of this year's Dean's Diversity Forum. You know, the idea of focusing on those children who are frequently missed in education with pathways that can really help them fully realize their talents and their potential is one of is one that really needs our collective energy to identify, develop, and ultimately scale uh, solutions. As educators and administrators, how should we think about those pathways through the education system in relation to broader cultural, legal, and policy environments? It's a, it's a question that was in fact essential to the vision set forth by the Cooper Union's founder, Peter Cooper. He, he saw that extending educational opportunities to all, regardless of class, race, or gender is an important task for a democracy because the potential of our students so profoundly touches upon all aspects of society and civic life, right? The idea that equitable access to education has the power to create a more equitable society is one that has continually shaped and re reshaped my own path as well. It also reflects the perspective that I want to share with you today, a perspective that I think often gets neglected in higher education specifically, um, and that is that the path to educational success must be seen as part of a lifelong continuum of learning. And that continuum doesn't just begin with high school college prep and end at college graduation. It really starts at a very young age with early childhood education, moves into the elementary and middle school years where we often see disparities really begin to grow in profound ways and continues on through high school, higher education or advanced vocational school and into adulthood. And in the ways that our students carry forward their talents as the next generation of teachers, policymakers, parents, professionals and citizens. Um, I'll share briefly the story of one trailblazing Cooper Union alumna who we've started to hear a little bit about today and who I think exemplifies the power of a lifelong continuum of learning and of teaching and who I was thrilled um, to learn served as an inspiration for the title of this forum. The great sculptor, arts educator, and activist Augusta Savage began her life in 1892 near Jacksonville, Florida. She took an early interest in sculpture and teaching art, though as a black woman and as the daughter of a poor minister, she had very few outlets for pursuing her work. Um, it wasn't until she was 29 years old that she moved to New York City and applied to the Cooper Union where, when it was determined that she couldn't afford tuition at the School of American Sculpture. Her talents so impressed the Cooper Union Advisory Council that she was granted admission ahead of 142 men on the waiting list. After graduating in 1925, she would go on to study sculpture and exhibit works in Europe. When she returned to the United States, she began teaching. Um, inspired in part by the opportunity afforded her at the Cooper Union, she opened the Savage Studio of Arts and Crafts in Harlem to anyone who wanted to learn. It, it was there that she taught generations of young black artists, including Jacob Lawrence, Norman Lewis, and Gwendolyn Knight. She eventually appoint, was appointed uh, director of the Harlem Community Arts Center, where she led workshops and courses that served people of all ages from the surrounding neighborhoods and served a vital role in inspiring many young artists associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Augusta Savage also became a fierce advocate for the inclusion of Black artists in the Works Progress Administration. She was one of only four women 
and the only Black artist commissioned to exhibit at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And it was there that alongside uh, Willem de Kooning and Salvador Dali that she presented what would become one of her best known works, a 16 foot plaster sculpture titled Lift Every Voice and Sing, depicting a chorus of black figures united in song. Because there was no funding to preserve or cast the piece in bronze, the sculpture was sadly destroyed um, when the exhibition closed in 1940. Augusta Savage, you know, ever committed to the social promise of education, once said, as we've heard, uh, as we heard earlier, quote, I have created nothing really beautiful, really lasting, but if I can inspire one of these youngsters to develop the talent I know they possess, then my monument will be in their work. Developing the talents of the coming generations can be the monument for all of us in this work together. Striving to support educational and economic opportunities for all has really been a through line of my own educational continuum and professional career. Uh, from my background as an attorney to my time in community development finance, my role as executive director of the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia, and now at the Cooper Union, much of my work has really been about trying to find multi-sector and multi-stakeholder solutions to what are very complex social problems. We live in an increasingly complex world, and there are just very few problems today that have a single lane to a solution. I've found that it's really often the combination of the private sector, public sector, and civic sector coming together that makes something happen. Um, at the William Penn Foundation, just as an example, our educational grant making really focused on organizations and initiatives working to improve access to high quality education for children for children, um, really from birth to age eight, and to accelerate learning readiness for a lifetime. That work in large part uh, about expanding access for young children, no matter their zip code, um, to high quality pre-K, as well as creating opportunities to foster family engagement in learning, um, better equipped qualified educators and early childhood education centers, uh, create a literacy rich environment um, in school and out of school, and uh, to support efforts for fair educational funding at the state level as, um, as the representative spoke about earlier, so critically important. Um, that really required civic leadership um, and private support like the foundations and others and collaboration among academia, nonprofits and an engaged citizenry to really help raise the bar effectively. No single, um, no single constituent, no single group could have done that uh, on its own. Um, the effort and the foundation's investment in it continues today with really the goal of dramatically increasing the number of young Philadelphians who are ready for kindergarten and reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, as I said, there's you know, really a through line to here to what I see today as really the great promise of the Cooper Union's mission. Um, Cooper Union's founding mission of providing free access to education for working class men and women of all races was at the time a radical affirmation of what higher learning could achieve. Learning about the Cooper Union's history was exciting for me because of how closely it aligned with so many of the aspects of work I've done over the course of my career. And I really found inspiration in Peter Cooper's conviction that education ought to be both practical, right, teaching tangible skills to help better people's lives in economic situations for themselves and for their families, as well as an experience that is intellectual, that will prepare students for active citizenship, and that will drive society forward by reaching students whose imagination, whose skill, whose ingenuity and drive are really deserving of opportunities that they might not otherwise have access to. The most valuable perspective that I've drawn from my experiences into this role as college president is really understanding the principles of fair access in a holistic and structural way, right? The intersecting problems we face nationally across higher education can in one way or another be traced to systemic failures that impact childhood education and extend into adulthood. Whether it's the subtle ways in which the idea that STEM is for boys 
is perpetuated or the fact that underfunded school districts can't afford the basic costs of education as we've heard so much about this morning or the ways in which so many college graduates really struggle to start their careers because they are so burdened with student debt. All along that path, there are countless points where the system can fail students. And so the sooner we intervene and start building momentum in a child's life, the higher the chance they will be able to sustain that momentum and make course corrections on their own. Uh, there's, there's much debate in the, Though there's much debate in the research, early childhood education and development studies have really convincingly shown us that stable and supportive environments at an early age can correlate significantly with learning advantages and career attainment much later in life, right? Which means it also has the potential to disrupt the poverty cycle for individuals, families, and communities. Um, an often cited data point that comes from the University of Chicago uh, economist and Nobel Prize winner James Heckman, uh, who suggested that every dollar spent on education yields a seven to twelve dollar return via a more skilled labor force, right? Higher productivity and earnings, better health outcomes, as well as lower crime and poverty levels, lower welfare use, um, and better education, and uh, lower health care costs. And yet, we shouldn't think that because a child lacks educational resources um, today, that they are necessarily limited in realizing their talents later on. That's why every, every step along that path is so important, right? Every step along that path is an opportunity for intervention. And that's why programs that offer exposure to learning opportunities, whether in high school or much earlier, continue to be so important for our mission at Cooper Union. As Peter Cooper, I think, well understood, a college education is a civic, social, and political process of preparing enlightened citizens. It has the power to transform individuals and, in turn, to empower individuals to transform society for the better. Uh, but that process only works if all parts of a society have access to it. So lowering the cost of barriers to a college education and alleviating the financial burden after graduation is really central to our mission for all of these reasons. Um, but we also work to ensure that we're reaching students who have a high, high achievement potential, but because they lack access to resources might be excluded from the standard admissions pipeline. Um, for STEAM education, we need programs in different disciplines that offer pathways for students from K-12 through college, right? One of the most important things that we can do is to engage them in learning that excites them, that engages them in their passions and potential interests. And I'll, I'll share just a few examples of things that, um, that we're doing at Cooper. Um, during the late 1960s, a group of Cooper Union undergraduates and faculty organized free weekend studio art courses offered to New York City high school students through what uh, became known as the Saturday program. Uh, it's a program which is taught by Cooper undergraduates, um, has evolved to also encompass a network of art teachers, guidance counselors, and administrators at more than 40 New York City area high schools, and really provides young people with hands-on access to Cooper's facilities, um, to art supplies, to instructional resources at no cost. And um, we even provide Metro cards so that the cost of public transportation isn't a barrier, right? Because it's also, it's often a simple thing like that that can really prevent a student from having access to an opportunity. Um, high schoolers also get guidance in building their portfolios for college admission so that re they really feel connected to the process and have support in that process, um, not only in their school and hopefully at home as well, but also at, at Cooper. That program has reached more than 11,000 students from underserved communities. And we see many of those students go on to gain acceptance at Cooper Union for their college degree and at many other institutions um, to study art um, and to study architecture in leading institutions across the country. Um, similarly, we offer a variety of STEM outreach, uh, STEM outreach programs that have proven highly effective in exposing high school students to um, intellectual challenges and ideas about their future that they might not otherwise um, encounter or have an opportunity to work through and establishes a pathway for underrepresented groups to pursue STEM education. 
Um, our STEM Saturday program, for example, is uh, you know, a series of free educational sessions that enroll about 50 students a year, mostly from under-resourced New York City schools. Um, they're taught by our undergraduates and graduates. You get that mentorship component in the work. Um, and they also offer career counseling and college planning sessions with Cooper staff members. Again, really trying to make available resources that can help a student at all points along the way kind of get to that next step. And almost all of the students who complete the course report that they plan to pursue a, a STEM degree in college. Um, you know, we see similar positive outcomes among those who, um, who complete the program. 97% um, plan to attend college at the end of the program. 93%, uh, as I said, plan on studying science or engineering in college. So, you know, these programs are important, yes, because they provide access and affordability at Cooper, but also um, offer us, I think, a chance to really sustain and share what we learn. Right, because um, it doesn't, you know, we can impact 50 students, 100 students, 1,000 students every year. There are millions of students that need to have access to these opportunities. And so part of what we're trying to do at Cooper is to have a direct impact on students with our own programs, um, but also, as I said, to share those learnings outward um, to try to serve as important proof points for why access and affordability matter more broadly for the future of education and consequently for the future of pros the prosperity of this country and for living out our nation's founding ideals of equal opportunity for all. Uh, so let me um, stop there. Very happy to be with you today. Thank you once again for including me and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, President Sparks. So let's... Let us um, open it up for um, questions. Great. So one of the um, greatest, as you talked about, the greatest barriers for access to higher education is obviously the cost. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, many of the members of this audience um, have incurred as students incredible debt um, to secure their education. Um, I'm wondering if you could just comment on current uh, proposals for student loan forgiveness um, and uh, what role you see those as having in helping to facilitate that access to education that you spoke about. Right, so the question notes that cost is a barrier to education and asked President Sparks to comment upon current proposals for student loan forgiveness. So um, let me start by saying, I think the long-term solution to this problem lies in trying to create an environment in which students do not need to generate debt in order to access college in the first place. Um, uh, certainly what we're trying to do at Cooper and certainly what I advocate for in, in many other um, forums. So I think in the long-term, you know, avoiding the possibility of debt is I think the the important direction to take. Having said that, obviously we have a tremendous uh, burden of student loan debt in this country. And as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, it's, it's an incredibly complex problem, this idea of loan forgiveness. I think there are very clearly cases um, where debt should be forgiven. Um, the, the easiest cases are the cases in which, um, you know, institutions have not been fully transparent with students about uh, the total cost of what that debt will be, the prospects for paying it back at the end. Um, but also we have the complication of the last uh, several years and what is likely to be a very complex uh, immediate future given everything going on in our economy and the socio-political environment. So um, I, I think it is not as simple as um, let's forgive student debt for everyone, um, right? There are lots of families, for example, who have the means uh, to repay debt, um, who took on debt as part of a broader financial calculation of what made sense in their own financial portfolios. Um, you know, families with means who may have taken on debt because it was a lower cost option uh, than, um, than providing it outright given their investment portfolios. I think those are not cases in which debt should be forgiven. But then we have very real um, situations where students um, cannot afford to take on the debt or perhaps go into public areas of public interest, um, which will not afford them the salaries to be able to uh, repay debt over time. And I think those are situations that need to be looked at um, very seriously. I think one of the you know, greatest um, tragedies that we've experienced in the legal field as an example is the significant decline 
in, in graduates who feel that they can go on to serve in the public interest because of the enormous amount of debt that they have. So I think there's a, a significant range of people who have outstanding debt. I think there's a significant portion where we really should look at uh, as a country for giving that debt. And then I think there are certain cases in which it does not, uh, it does not make sense because families took on the debt, um, knowing that there's an ability to repay and essentially trying to maximize financial returns through the process. Thank you. Yes. Libraries and some of the issues going on with libraries and schools. If there's any strategy to just get children access to books and how that would work at perfect agreement. So the question asked about a strategy to get books to children with public libraries under pressure, um, some closing, um, and maybe funding issues there as well, as well as um, challenges in some communities to the books that are in school libraries. Um, what are your thoughts on um, how we might go about getting books to children and helping facilitate their education? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's um, a question that is near and dear to my heart for a few reasons. One, um, Peter Cooper actually started the Cooper Union first as a public reading room, uh, open um, very late into the night so that people who had to work during the day could have access to books freely um, in the evenings. Uh, the other reason is that um, one of the things that I was um, most proud and most fortunate to work on when I was at the William Penn Foundation was really um, working with organizations that were trying to um, improve and expand access to um, parks, rec centers, and libraries in local communities. Libraries are often the only remaining public resource in an underserved community and end up providing much more actually than books often provide um, job training services, resume building services, and a safe place uh, for children to stay after school. Um, so I think it's hugely important I think some of the best public dollars that we can spend are on libraries, on increasing the hours for libraries, in addition to the books um, that are available. Of course, you know, technology is changing the ways in which we act, uh, the ways in which we engage with books, including children at a young age. And so I think making sure that uh, children have access uh, not only to physical books, um, in libraries, which can create uh, sort of an important socio and emotional connection between the adult reader and the child, um, but also access to technology that can give them, uh, give students access to a wide, a wider range um, of resources and often uh, more cheaply than the, the physical books. Thank you. Please join me in thanking President Sparks for joining us today. Thank you. All right, this concludes our first hour. We'll take a 10 minute break and return at 10 after the hour. I can just. All right, good morning. <laughs> Uh, my name is Summer Panizzo. I'm a 2 here, 2L here at Widener Commonwealth Law School. I'm also president of Outlaw. Now, before I begin talking about Outlaw, I want to explain that my first year at Widener was not typical. My first year was online on Zoom, where I had never been on campus, never really met anyone in person um, until my second year. And during my first year, I noticed there, there was an organization missing. And so I reached out to administration and they said there was once an outlaw organization catering for LGBTQ activism, but due to you know, the, how hard it is to run an organization and the lack of rec representation, it, it just fizzled out. And so I had the great idea of well, let's start an organization on Zoom in my first year of law school. <laughs> and when I say that I never expected Outlaw to become what it has today, I'm being honest. Our first year, we had events. It was just me and my friends sitting in a Zoom room. <laughs> um, we, 
I would never expect outlaw to be as impactful as it is. And uh, I wanna explain to you what I mean by impactful. So during our first year on Zoom, we worked with the school to change gendered language in the career counseling guide. So when you now go to those guides and you look for how to dress for an interview, there is no longer he should wear, she should wear. It is gender neutral and it is important for that language to be in a, a section of a dress code like that because it it's the school acknowledging that we don't, you don't have to dress a certain way for your gender. So then we move in person and we have done so much more this year and I'm still in shock. I could not, we could not do it with the help of the school, the student body um, and the e-board we have. We have held family fun festivals um, along with LALSA, BALSA, Women's Law Caucus and creating a safe space for families to bring their kids and have fun and just to learn about every organization we have here on campus. Um, we have worked with the school to advocate for uh, more diversity and as well as more diverse support for the students. Uh, we now have resources uh, for students where they can go see a um, counselor who caters in, um, you know, caters to transgender students. That just started this year due to outlaw working with Widener. We have had fundraisers so we could donate to um, the LGBTQ community here in Harrisburg. And currently we are in contact with Big Brother Big Sister to create workshops for parents, children, and their mentors on how to navigate in an LGBTQ world and how allies can help. We are affiliated with the LGBTQ Bar Association. And I love saying this, uh, if you go on their website and to their map of what states have outlaw organizations, we are there, we are on the map. Outlaw is there, we want to be loud and we want to be proud so that way, when I leave my tenure, tenure as president, that there is not another instance where a student comes in and says, what happened to Outlaw? I, again, I am extremely proud and I really would not be able to accomplish what we have without the help of the school and without the help of really the entire student body. We cannot fundraise without the student body showing up. We cannot advocate without the student body expressing what needs to change. Um, currently for the spring, we have a make your own flag event where you can make any flag that caters to your representation. You do not need to be a part of the LGBTQ community to come and make a flag. It could be anything that represents yourself. We also have a lunch and learn coming in April where we can discuss these topics that are seemingly uncomfortable to talk about, but we are creating safe spaces so these conversations can happen. Um, and so Outlaw is a great organization here at Widener and we are working on making ourselves more permanent and striving for just the best so we can create not only Widener more diverse, but Harrisburg. And I, and I wanna thank the school for as much help as they have given us with that. But on top of being president of Outlaw, to, I have the great honor of introducing the moderator, Gerline Loror. Now she practices immigration law throughout Pennsylvania while serving as the director of the Intergovernmental Affairs and Mediation at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Ms. Loror also serves as the chair of the Pennsylvania Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, as well as on the PA Department Education Task Force for Equity and Inclusion. In addition, Ms. Loror sits on the board of governors of the World Affair Council of Harrisburg and has served on the Pennsylvania Bar Foundation Board of Governors. Ms. Lavore is active on numerous Pennsylvania Bar Association committees, 
and is the past secretary to the Governor's Advisory Commission on African American Affairs while she serves on the education chair. Ms. Lavor has been the recipient of numerous awards, including multiple awards from both the PBA and Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Ms. Lavor graduated high school in French Guiana and subsequently studied in France where she received her bachelor's degree in psychology and her master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Providence Center of X. She is currently pursuing her executive master's degree in public administration at the University of Pennsylvania Fells Institute of Government. And more importantly for us here today, we can proudly say Ms. Leroy received her Juris Doctor degree from our sister campus, Widener University Delaware Law School. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction and congratulations on all your hard work as president of Outlaw. Good morning, everyone. Uh, such an introduction for me to introduce. <laughs> um, it, gives, it gives me great joy and great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, Attorney Paige Jokey. Paige Jokey is a staff attorney at the Education Law Center where she represents students, conducts trainings and advocates to address the individual and systemic educational barriers facing students in Pennsylvania. She is responsible for leading the Education Law Center's Philadelphia-based, the Black Girls Education Justice Initiatives. Paige joined ELC staff in 2017 as an Independence Foundation Public Interest Law Fellow with a focus on eliminating individual and systemic barriers to equality education for students experiencing homelessness in the Philadelphia region. Paige received the Beth Cross Award for her notable contributions to public service at Temple and has been inducted into the Ruben Presser Public Interest Honor Society. Please, Join me in giving a wow, very warm welcome to attorney Jokey. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Paige, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning. I know I've learned a lot and I feel like there's a lot of power in spaces like this. I can recall in law school that Balsa was key to my success and key to having a place where I felt I had a home and a place that wasn't designed for me. So I also just wanted to give a bit of a trigger warning before I start talking because educational rights deprivations are racialized and both the deprivation in education and also the right to learn about our histories is a source of intergenerational trauma and historical trauma that we carry with us in our bodies. So I just invite you to take good care of yourself. If that means a bathroom break, if it means more coffee, if it means a snack, do it. You won't be bothering me at all. Um, but I'm very excited to move forward. If you can't hear me in the back, just please wave also. So as mentioned, I work at an organization called the Education Law Center. Oh, you can see this, which is a nonprofit legal advocacy organization that works to advance the rights of children and ensuring a quality public education for all children in the Commonwealth. We have three priority areas, which 
include, let's see if I can, is this going to let me click through? Oh, access to quality public education, adequate and equitable school funding. You might have seen us in the news for the William Penn litigation that's ongoing. We are suing the state for fair funding. If you're interested and have a laptop in front of you, if not a pen, check out fundourschools.org if you're interested more in the trial. I'll be giving you some highlights, but it's honestly a wonderful resource that breaks down really complicated legal arguments into accessible public documents. And we also dismantle the school to prison pipeline, also known as pathways to confinement, where conditions in school look like, feel like, and act like carceral spaces, and also push students from the classrooms where they have a legal right to attend and learn into systems of discipline and punishment that do not serve them. So some key topics today, because I love a good agenda, is talking about the enduring harms of educational deprivations. We'll be going from American slavery to present. So uh, we're going to be moving kind of quickly to situate key markers of educational deprivation survived by Black people from slavery to present, put our current conditions in schools into historical conversation, and provide a window into deprivations in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. And then I'll put forth some recommendations at the end that propose key policy changes and changes in the law to rectify the injustices that have been entrenched for centuries. So first, education really matters. I think we are told a lot about this, but it literally changes your trajectory. It defines how long people live. The more educated you are, the longer life you are going to have in our society. It creates generational access to physical health and well-being, things like healthcare and nutritious foods, distance from toxicity, access to community resources, and distance from environmental hazards. It also creates access to permanent and adequate housing. So there was just a study done by Chapin Hall that found that young people who did not have the educational privilege of high school or a GED were 346% more likely to be experiencing homelessness than their peers who did have this level of educational privilege. It also is in, it impacts our incarceration rate. So the more educated you are, the more likely you are not to come into systems of incarceration. So we have a history in this country, as everybody knows, that massive deprivations exist. They are irrefutable and they recur across generations. And since education doesn't exist in a vacuum, the communities that have schools that aren't invested in are also being subject to intentional deprivations of investment. So when you think about what's happening in the community, what happens in community goes into schools and vice versa. So just be holding that thought as we advance through. And when we talk about educational deprivations, I hear this a lot, but that they're cast as something that's normal, predictable, acceptable. There's that school over there. There are those children. These things are okay because some families have worked harder than others. And those are all tenets of white supremacy. And they're also narratives that we tell ourselves to justify gross inequities, which I'll get to in a little while. Um, and we also have depreciative language that is used for people rather than looking at young people's potential and what they can achieve with resources and supports, we cast them as being unable to learn, which has its roots in slavery. So dismantling the current system is a challenge as lawyers and aspiring lawyers and other professionals in this field. It's really challenging. And the reason, one of the many reasons why is because our constitution at the federal level doesn't guarantee a right to education. So it means that because there's no right, it's hard to challenge things. And our nation, of course, was built on a bedrock of white supremacy and the education system by design is anti-poor and anti-black. And the legal tools we have now are often ineffective at addressing the large scale systemic harms. And that's because there are access to justice barriers that preclude you from filing suit, even if you do have an actionable claim. So there are not enough attorneys that can take cases. So at Education Law Center, we run a helpline where families can call us and get free legal advice, but we get over 1,200 calls a year. And so even if somebody has a claim, it can be really difficult to actually be able to advance that and sue the school when necessary. The victories when you do win are often narrowly tailored to a particular student or a particular school or a particular district. So it's hard to make seismic changes in how things run. And the Supreme Court has narrowly limited the ability to challenge discriminatory practices that have a disparate impact. So let us go all the way back. <laughs> Racism is at the foundation of our country and slavery is its origin. And educational evils perpetuated and perpetrated against black people originate in slavery. 
education of people who were enslaved was prohibited in the law. The law says you cannot learn to read. And education itself was cast as a grave and specific threat to the institution of American slavery. So if you look at people's journals, they were talking specifically about education being key to dismantling structures that lead to oppression and dehumanization of black people. And despite these horrific conditions, some black people were able to covertly work to educate themselves and others. So this is at the spirit of black history is the ability to educate oneself even in the face of horrific conditions like slavery. And so black people come from a history of working to satisfy both intellectual and material needs. And then we get to Jim Crow. So while the 13th amendment formally ends American slavery in, in 1865, Black people who survive the institutions create their own schools. And these schools were really marvelous spaces. They're under, um, they're under focused upon in our research base, but there is some really great literature that talks about schools being centers for culture. Both male and female identified people were teachers at that time, which is rare and historical. And black people were learning things like reading and writing and math, but also learning cultural knowledge. And so when you think of models like community schools, like look back in history to see where these things are originating. So in the face of this, Southern states quickly assemble for public schools that are taxed and only serve white children. So what you have is black families paying taxes out of their own pockets to fund schools that won't educate their children. And in Pennsylvania, we're going to see a similar phenomenon carrying on today where black families are taxing themselves at much higher rates, but are not able to generate enough wealth in order to actually fund the schools that their children are attending. Then we have the 14th Amendment in 1868, uh, which guarantees all citizens equal protection of the laws. And then there is Plessy v. Ferguson, where the Supreme Court of the United States affirms racial segregation in schools and then further entrenches and condemns Black children to be placed in inferior educational environments. And while this is happening, Black schools are burned down and Black communities are terrorized. The federal and state government are often acting as accomplices in these horrific acts of terrorism, both silently and sometimes explicitly. So when you think about the right to education and you think about black people in this country, there is a history of these disruptions and this virulent opposition for the ability for us to learn, which is rooted in our history. Oops. Um, and then we have Murray v. Pearson, which was a case that Thurgood Marshall litigated around an aspiring black student who wanted to attend the University of Maryland Law School and was talking about the moral commitment to this. And I really appreciated the statistics at the beginning um, when the speaker from Walsa was speaking, but it is true that our profession is the least diverse in the country and that continues. So if you look at the American Bar Association in 2019, they last collected demographic information about lawyers who identify themselves as black and it's only 5% of lawyers, which is slightly higher than the statistic that you shared, um, but it's not good. <laughs> and this figure has remained for the last decade. So if you think about access to education, when you were denying little babies the right to education, those children are going to grow up and then also face barriers to access spaces like the one that we're in today. So now we get to Brown. Um, in 1954, SCOTUS unanimously decides that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And this remains our most important decision about the meaning of equity in our democracy. And it also paves the way for integration in other facets of life. And this decision also strikes at the heart of some of the tenets of white supremacy that are less known that I wanted to touch on. So first it talks about the intellectual abilities of black people to show that people are able to learn. It also struck back at ideas of health and cleanliness of black people. So if you read earlier decisions, there was a fear that black people were dirty. Um, they shouldn't be in the same physical spaces as white children. Meanwhile, black caregivers are literally feeding white children with their hands and are taking care of them. So when you think about how racism works, it has never really made sense because it doesn't, because it is based in thinking that is very harmful. But the decisions also show some of these contradictions that, that people were grappling with at the time and are still grappling with today. And it also struck back at pernicious sexual stereotypes around black men. 
And if you look about current debates about bathroom access and making sure everybody has a facility in order to take care of necessary business during the day, we see these same pernicious sexual stereotypes playing out. And so it's really important that we link those to our history um, to show that this is not a new argument. It's quite old and it has its basis in white supremacy. And so then after Brown one, there's of course massive resistance to oppose integration. And then we get to Brown two. So in Brown two, it was decided that states must desegregate with all deliberate speed. And then it punts to the federal courts to implement the order. And as we all know, um, or maybe don't know, Brown two actually leaves out two very important questions. And the first is when integration needs to occur. And the second is how it should proceed. So what immediately happens is it gives go ahead to the districts across the country that are supposed to be integrating to and to do all sorts of policies that frustrate integration. And um, also notably the word segregation is totally missing from the decision. A decision about segregation doesn't utter the word. So I just wanna let that hang <laughs> for a moment. And the original plaintiffs also don't get relief from this decision. So while it's heralded and it is so important, it isn't the end of our story. So now we're gonna to move to the 60s and the 90s. We're going through history very quickly this morning. So pardon me. Um, in 1968 and 1969, the Supreme Court of the United States finally gives a directive as aptly put by Nicole Hannah Jones that all deliberate speed needs now. So there are two cases um, up here that you can see and districts then race to have unitary status declared because once they're unitary, they can go right back to the same segregation, right? So there's this massive push to get cleared by the courts and then go back to the same tactics that deprive people of their education. And also many schools um, promptly resegregate. And then in the eighties, we see another wave of resistance that is very bitter from the Reagan and Bush administrations and the rise of the Rehnquist court that are hostile to integration. And in the 90s, many desegregation orders end and others continue for decades. So where are we today? Well, the bad news is that schools are even more segregated than they are in the times of Brown because segregation left to its own devices will persist and mutate and find new forms. And trends show that black students are bearing the brunt of segregated schools and communities, which are often the most under-resourced because of historic disinvestment, things like redlining, things like racist policing, things like um, other manifestations of white supremacy that make it really difficult for folks to be able to fund their schools. And our federal government shamefully has positioned itself largely in silent complicity. And there has been a de minimis investment in voluntary integration programs and decades have come and gone without any significant research or investment in integration, despite integration being very necessary. And there is also facially neutral language that has buttressed segregation along the lines of race, eligibility for special education and economic privilege. So let's talk about where we are seated currently in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. What does our landscape look like? And I'm very thankful to the prior powerful speakers for talking a little bit about this. And now I'm going to turn to some nuts and bolts about what we see in our own communities. So the Pennsylvania constitution requires that the General Assembly shall provide the maintenance and support of a thorough and efficient system of public education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth. So the catchphrase you will be hearing is thorough and efficient. Pennsylvania currently is failing in that duty and that's why Education Law Center, Public Interest Law Center and our pro bono partners at OMM are suing the state for fair funding. It's the William Penn litigation, closing statements were on the 10th. So it is very timely. We ranked seventh least in the country in educational investment. And that's because we have an over-reliance on property taxes and the state is not funding its fair share of education. It is not just that money needs to be redistributed differently, it's that the pie needs to be grown and more equitably distributed. Because currently 53% of revenue for schools comes from local property taxes, 34 comes from the state and 13 comes from the federal government. So those numbers would need to readjust themselves in order to actively be equitable. And by the school code's own adequacy measure, we fall short by $4.6 billion, that's billion with a B. And when you think about tangible outcomes, it's that students in the lowest well school district are being deprived of $4,800 of resources when you compare them to students who are in higher well school districts. And then when you include race in that, and my next slide is gonna show you a fancy graph, you'll see that that's even more stark. And that's because property taxes are the largest source of funding. So you have communities that are taxing themselves at higher rates, but the property values aren't high enough to generate that 
wealth. So what you see is communities of color are repeatedly taxing themselves over and over and over, and yet they still can't generate the funds that are needed. And Pennsylvania also has the notorious position of being some of the most racially segregated schools in the country. Oftentimes racial segregation is um, misappropriated to only be in relation to Southern schools, but we have it right here. Our own schools are some of the most racially segregated and they're actually the most economically segregated in the country, like full stop. That's happening here. If we go outside, it's happening. Um, and so black children are bearing the brunt of this. I'm just gonna put this graph up so you can see. So in an equitable system, this nice line, the line that goes through the black line should be how schools map if the system was equitable because it's looking at the rates of free and reduced lunch, which is how we measure poverty, and then how much resources you should be getting. So what should happen is you should be tracking those resources by student wealth. What we see though, is that white students who are living in poverty are getting more money than black students that are in the exact same position. So the blue dots are schools that are hyper-segregated white and the red dots are schools that are hyper-segregated black. So low wealth white school districts receive more funds than similarly situated black and brown districts, despite controlling. So even when you control for poverty, those things are different. And this also matters because there's a $2,000 per student gap on top of the gap that I already shared. So our system doesn't make sense. It's irrational and it is inequitable and it is harmful. And so when we also think about like what's going on in schools, I think people hear like there's not enough funding, but like what does that actually look like? and buckle up because it's horrifying. We have physical facilities that are poisonous to teachers and students. There is lead in buildings, there is asbestos in buildings, there is mold in buildings. I can tell you I went to a school for a special education meeting and I tried to drink out of the water fountain and the principal grabbed my arm and said, you can't drink out of there, there's lead. And showed me to a back room where there was a water fountain but the children in that school were being exposed to toxins which we know create lifelong challenges. There are vermin and other environmental hazards like you would be sitting in class and there would be mice in the floor. There are roaches. We cannot hire enough people to do sanitation. Students are deprived of the most basic education essentials every day. There are not enough desks for pupils. There are not current textbooks or some schools do not have textbooks for students that are sufficient. You will be sharing with somebody else. There are not adequate specialized personnel and staffing. There are not counselors. There are not nurses. There are not people to take care of students' daily needs. And they're, despite the folks that are in the building who are trying and doing what they can, the numbers just aren't enough to serve students at a level that is safe and appropriate. There are also unsafe temperatures. In the school district of Philadelphia, you will see notices that school buildings are closing because it is too hot in the summer and it is too cold. So the physical conditions would be harmful to people to be in the building and so they close school. And when children aren't in school, that impacts parents and their ability to get to jobs and so forth. There's also inadequate bathroom access. I noticed that when our session took a break, we sort of flocked to different places. In some of our schools, the bathroom ratios are honestly shocking and horrifying of one toilet per 75 kindergartners who are learning toileting skills. That can't be our reality moving forward. That is not justifiable. And we also have toxic school climates that harm black students in particular. Um, there are school codes and student handbooks, which are the rules that you have to follow or face discipline. I'm sure Widener has one of these also that tells you what you do and what you don't do and what you can't do. But public schools have a lot of these regulations. And like, these are thick things that are multiple pages. And me as an attorney, I'm confronted with 60 pages of stuff. And a lot of it doesn't make sense. So I'm actually going to show you some excerpts and I'm going to go through some of them. So the rules are often racialized and subjective. And schools across the country, including in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, have rules that punish Black students for showing up to school how they are. So some schools in Pennsylvania, they could discipline me for showing up literally with what I'm wearing and tell me I can't go to school. They could suspend me and some kids would, ex some schools would expel me. And that's wrong. There are bias in how we impose subjective discipline that determines who is punished and how severe the punishment is. And excluding students from the learning environment is really harmful, whether it's suspension or expulsion, which is a suspension lasting more than 10 consecutive school days. So children are pushed out by the, like starting at the time they're in diapers in preschool. And it's just important for me to say that there is no research that shows that black and brown kids misbehave or engaging in inappropriate or appropriate 
um, behaviors that we might like them not to engage in more likely than white children. There is nothing that shows that. So what is actually happening is students, no matter who they are, are engaging and often age appropriate misbehaviors at the same rate, but it is black and brown children that are being punished and students who are people with disability that are being punished. So I'm just gonna throw some statistics up so you can see them. The deprivation of education is huge. So black students miss five times the number of school days because they're excluded. Black girls are 7.3 more times likely to be suspended than white girls. And 47% of black preschoolers have been suspended from a preschool program where they are learning the most basics for their ability to engage in school later on. We have horrifying numbers. We know them to be an undercount. And why is that? Because schools do not submit data like they need to. And they also have lots of ways to have constructive suspensions so they're not counted. Things I see are they get a call and they say, Jimmy's having a tough day, mom. Can you pick him up for school? Can you pick him up from school? That's a suspension. Kids are being told that they can just go home. I've had cases of elementary students where they open the school doors and just say walk home for the day. They are warehoused in another room where they're not learning or they're told that they can't come back. One particularly impactful example that comes to mind for me as one of my students who was physically locked out of school, they saw her coming and they locked all the school doors and said, you can't come in. And then they marked her absent. And then they tried to prosecute her parents for truancy despite that they were literally locking her out of educational spaces. And suspensions cause grievous and multi-generational harm. A single suspension, one of them, impedes the ability for students to graduate from high school and they fail to improve outcomes. So when you allow teachers to kick students out of class, it is not actually helpful. It is not helpful to the student who's being removed and it's not helpful for the students that remain. And a 2008 Government Accountability Office report that found that suspensions were more likely to increase, that students were pushed out of school altogether, that they were forced to repeat a grade due to the number of times they were excluded, and they were more likely to come into contact with the juvenile justice system and later the adult justice system. We also have discriminatory enforcement because schools use racialized and subjective behaviors to allow decision makers to punish and exclude kids. And they're disciplined for a vast array of undefined behaviors. And I'm just gonna pop all these up and highlight some of them for you. Um, things like disrespectful tone and body language with no definition, talking back, refusing to cooperate, being rude, silently mouthing words, slouching. You can be suspended and expelled for these behaviors and sucking your teeth. Um, there are also discriminatory grooming codes and I'm gonna start with banned hairstyles. So hairstyles that are not neat, not that are innovative, that are flamboyant, that are not well-groomed, that are colored and highlighted in any flamboyant colors. I would be a foul of that one because I got some red up in here. Um, and they could also say I had excessive parts. And so these things are all, these, these undefined school codes target black people for wearing their hair in culturally expressive styles like mine, and it's wrong. But it happens. You can't have combs or headscarves like the scarf I got in my bag. You can't have weave caps, you can't have do-rags, you can't have timberlands, you can't have hooped earrings larger than the size of the quarter. And when you think about what people wear and obviously black people express themselves in an array of styles and comport our bodies differently, but like these are some things that are pretty clearly targeting black people and schools are allowed to do this. And so this is one thing I work against every single day um, or excessive jewelry, not sure what that means. And so these rules send the clear and unmistakable message that students are unwanted and unwelcome at school. And then there are also some subjective practices that harm families. So caregivers can be banned from schools without a prior appointment for undefined behavior. What I see in practice is parents are standing up for toxic school conditions like harassment, and they're told you could never come back to school without an appointment or they're calling the police. Here's an excerpt from the school district of Philadelphia that does this practice. We have seen these notices weaponized against black mothers advocating for their children. They rely on law enforcement for vaguely defined parental behavior. Um, so any parent that poses a threat or a danger, in practice, I see things like showing up and saying, my child's being bullied, can you help me? A raised voice showing up in a way that could be perceived as threatening. And we know that stereotypes, particularly around black women, make it a lot more likely that somebody's gonna perceive me to be angry than somebody else saying the same words because their skin color is different than mine. And then finding caregivers, this is a personal, um, one that's really, really horrific to me, but there's a school in the Philadelphia area called the Alliance for Progress Charter School, which fines parents a dollar a minute per kid if they are late to pick up beyond five minutes when we don't have buses that work. 
And by the way, these fines are due at the time that you come to school. And if you have fines, your kid can't participate in any school program. And also you're not getting your kid's report card. And these are the conditions that we expect kids to learn in. And that doesn't work because they're not welcoming spaces where kids are affirmed. So obviously COVID has been a huge impact. Also black and brown people are bearing the brunt of this. This image, I guess the only one that survived my massive image cut due to file size. So apologies for no pictures. What you see is armed police officers waiting in line. This is code red um, during COVID when it wasn't safe to come outside for caregivers to get devices. What we saw is that and initially in COVID before the state forced schools to do otherwise, the school district of Philadelphia offered nothing to families because it would be too costly. Meanwhile, we have schools that are white and very well resources that transition seamlessly and even had more supports for students. Ultimately, the school district of Philadelphia did distribute devices, things did change, but it's important to know that that was what they did at first. And the reason they cited was equity reasons. So not good. So what do we do? Well, a lot of stuff. The first is that we need to amend our constitution to provide a right to education that is adequate, equitable, and culturally competent and free of segregation. Why? Because education needs to be enumerated as a right in and of itself, and it would also eliminate the patchwork of states having different standards for young people because where you live and your zip code and the accident of geography determines what type of education you're getting, which is horrible. We also need more effective legal tools um, that are more fortified. So we need to expand disparate impact to the educational context so you'll be able to prove discrimination without proving discriminatory intent. Um, having a clear right of action in education civil rights laws, and that means you have a right to sue. Currently we have education laws that there actually isn't a right to sue if the school is breaking them so they can violate students' rights with impunity. We need disaggregated data that is intersectional that triggers consequences. So we need to be looking at what is happening to students who are LGBTQ in schools, who are also black, who are also people who have disabilities. And we need to have this data because hiding the facts obscures that there are problems. So what schools say is kids are doing fine, and they say that by looking at the statistics, but they're not actually gathering them. So there is no basis to say students are fine. And what we do know is that students are not fine at all. And so this data would help and also making schools accountable if they're not submitting data. So schools can be celebratory and affirming spaces. They can adopt um, affirming an anti-racist curriculum. They can have restorative ju justice practices that are rooted in the knowledge and culture of indigenous peoples. They can have affirming dress and grooming policies that allow students to express their culture and gender and the prohibit discrimination on body type, size, or appearance. We can provide culturally affirming mental health supports. We can provide support to address racism, sexism, and ableism, and other matrices of oppression. We can have police-free environments, and we can root out having exclusion as the first tool that people have. We can create suspension bans, for example, and we can also eliminate subjective school rules that allow decision makers to make choices about who is punished and who is going to be allowed to remain in the classroom and learn. And I'm quite glad to hear that Widener's made some improvements to their student guide. I think it's really important. We at Education Law Center, just a few weeks ago, in our own handbook, have it so now people can wear culturally affirming clothes to work, culturally affirming hairstyles and dress in a way that honors their identity and culture. And schools need to be built upon foundations of equity. They should adopt affirming policies that have equity at a foundation. So what is happening in the building? Who is there? And do equity audits. That way, school community members can have input on what equity looks like and feels like because different communities are facing different harms. And um, what you would see here, and it's so funny that um, President Sparks mentioned this, but the image you would see is a Jacob Lawrence panel from the Great Migration Series, which has three black girls reaching on a chalkboard. It's really beautiful. But black children deserve education spaces where they can learn and grow and thrive. And we have the tools and the power to make those changes if we just put in the investment. So thank you. I know that was a lot of stuff coming at you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much for this very enlightening presentation, Attorney Jokey. Um, <clears throat> across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there are superintendents who are allies and who are committed to ensuring that students feel included. However, they are facing uh, intimidation tactics 
from uh, parents as well as uh, from board members, school board members. What advice, if any, do you have for these superintendents? I think it's really important to set the tone early about what is and what isn't acceptable at school. And we can have cultural changes and we can have different environments where students are learning. And I think it's really, it can be difficult in the face of assault on student rights to hold that line, but it's really important. Um, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association has an equity toolkit and has assessments for leaders to learn the tools necessary to create equitable, fair, and affirming school environments. And there are things that are, there are resources that superintendents can access. I know sometimes there's a cost barrier, but that's one thing they can do. They can look at their school code and put a big red line through things that hurt kids like subjective discipline. They can train school board members. They can train teachers. They can have spaces that look affirming. I know for me, I went into an elementary school once for a meeting and there was music playing and there were children smiling and there was beautiful artwork on the walls. And I heard staff asking, how are you doing today? And just the environment was really different. And so there are things also that don't cost money that can be investments. And I think the other thing is being willing to say racism is wrong. Somehow that's controversial now, but I think holding that line is really important. And also showing like who's in your school. It's important to see leaders who look like you. And so making sure that you're keeping teachers and you're addressing conditions at school because children are watching. And if you're treating their parents with contempt and you're treating people that look like them with contempt, they're gonna notice. So sort of having those types of interventions I think can make a big difference. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience at this point? Pennsylvania schools are so terrible. Like, is there any statistics that have come up that show why our state is performing in the way that it is? Yes. Okay. Oh. Yes. Um, the question was, is there a reason as to why Pennsylvania schools are so terrible um, and why they're performing as they are? I hope I got that okay. Um, sorry, I should have been closer to this mic so you could hear me a little bit better. So yes, I think if you want a deep dive, again, visit fundourschoolspa.org because there is a lot of information, but we know that money matters in education justice. And so the first thing we need to do, one among many, is change the way we fund schools so they are actually able to educate children and they're equitable. I think also we need leadership um, and the Pennsylvania Department of Education to issue guidance that talks about what types of conditions are permissible and are not permissible in our schools. There are actually a lot of really good resources on the Pennsylvania Department's website, but it's important. And then the other thing I think that needs to happen is for us to have an honest conversation about where Pennsylvania is situated. Um, people are denied information about how schools are performing and people don't know our history of education. And so I think presentations that sort of explain that to folks and talk to them about their rights are really important. And then making sure that students and families who are in the schools experiencing the conditions know when it is appropriate to advocate. They're great decision makers on that, have the skills to do it and are supported by legal professionals when necessary. Not that everybody's got needs to be sued, but sometimes it has to happen. And I'm very thankful that I can be one of the people doing it. Attorney Jake, Attorney Jake, you mentioned um, in your presentation that the parents, the plaintiffs of, in the case of Board of Education, did not receive. Did not receive remedy. Mm -hmm. What type of remedies could you, um, could you explain the type of remedies that are available to plaintiffs um, who file those cases? Yeah, so there can be injunctive relief. So things where schools actually have to change their policies and their practices, there can be monetary relief. So something that's very common, especially in the special education context is called compensatory education, which is money for services that children were denied. So for example, if I need the support of a speech language therapist and I wasn't getting it, they could give me money so I could get that service on my own. The problem is when education civil rights violations are happening in real time, the remedy is retrospective, so it's funny. But we know that children are learning at really important developmental stages, and so even those remedies aren't complete because you may be several years away from getting a remedy even if you get one. Other things that can happen is school boards can make changes about rules, schools can adopt cultural competency measures, they can provide training for staff, which can be a remedy, and just as I'm certain, you know, as future lawyers and lawyers and other professionals, like a lot of cases actually settle. So sometimes schools 
well, they always have confidentiality agreements in those, you know, so it can be difficult to actually target the practice if you're not writing in systemic relief um, into those spaces. But in order to make remedies better, it can't just be for one child or one district. It actually needs to be broader than that. But the ways our laws are set up, it's really hard to make those systems level changes, of course, because white supremacy does a great job of like keeping itself alive. So we have to change the way our laws are written in order to create more opportunities for more holistic changes. A question from the public. This is probably more because I'm not from the state of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. I'm from Massachusetts, but I noticed in a lot of your references of policies that came from either academies or charter schools. Is Pennsylvania kind of more built up with charter schools as opposed to public schools in terms of in which would make a difference is in terms of where the funding is going and where it's not going versus like private schools or other academies? Yeah, so it is really confusing. Yes, thank you. So the question was about the PowerPoint slide that I put up that had discriminatory examples of policies. It was noted that many of those examples were charter schools. And the question was about the impact of charter schools and private schools on public schools and the educational landscape. As a representative McClinton shared, we have about 501 different LEAs, those are local education agencies. So um, public schools are neighborhood schools. So where you go in your catchment, they are also charter schools and cyber charter schools. So it's 501 of these things that are out here. And so it's really difficult to sort of give examples. The reason why there are a lot of charter schools on that list from the Philadelphia area is because the school district of Philadelphia has much better language around grooming, but the schools are allowed to set their own school code. And so if we were to do a deep dive into five 501 schools, I'm certain we'd find other examples, but these are ones that we have dealt with or that have um, harmed students that I have served. That's not to say everybody on that list has done that, but their school code is discriminatory. And in order to address that discrimination, they need to change their code. I hope that helps. I'm also not from Pennsylvania. I'm from Idaho. So it's, it's very confusing when you step into this landscape and suddenly it's like everybody's sort of doing their own thing, which is why we need federal rights and why we need clearer laws. So it isn't just like, oh, you go to this school. So this is sort of what you get. Thank you for your question. Um, Attorney Jokey, could you please explain the adultification bias and how it impacts the school to prison pipeline? I would be delighted. So um, could I just get a show of hands for if folks have ever heard the word adultification? Perfect. Okay, so adultification is when children who are children are treated as adults for their behavior, and they're seen to be more adult-like, to be more responsible, and to be more culpable for behaviors that are very much behaviors of children. So for example, if you had a student speaking out of turn, you could say that that child is very engaged in their education. You could also say that they are rude or disrespectful or challenging a teacher. And what we see that as young as preschool, black girls are seen to be more adult-like than their white peers, which makes disciplining them more justifiable in the eyes of decision makers. So you might hear things like, she's so grown, or she was trying to run the staff in the school or things I've heard, or she intentionally did something. But adultification makes it more likely that the needs of young people aren't going to be honored, that they're going to be blamed and subjected to very extreme discipline instead of being met with support. So an example I can give you is one of my clients was five years old. She has autism and emotional disabilities and also has a specific learning disability in reading and would become overwhelmed by crowded classroom conditions. And she was in a kindergarten class with 30 other children. She was screaming because she was overwhelmed and very scared. And the school responded by calling 911 on her and trying to get her psychiatrically committed. And so that is adultification. So the idea that children are perceived to be older than they are and more culpable, there's a wonderful piece called Girlhood Interrupted. If you haven't read it, I recommend you read it. There are excellent scholars um, that have put forth work in this area and it's really important to understand because the ways we treat children, particularly black girls are really rooted in these racist ideologies that you can go all the way back to slavery around mammies and Jezebels and things like that. So if you haven't read it, please do. The work is exceptional. Are there any? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit 
bit about the role that the pandemic has had in inequality in education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the pandemic, um, the question was, I'll do this right this time, what impact has the pandemic had on education? As we know, we still have an active pandemic, but what we've seen is that inequities that were already really bad have been made significantly worse, and they've also been exposed, which is something that's really important. So um, when initially when schools didn't have the obligation to operate, a lot of schools shut down. Like for example, the school district of Philadelphia for a while was distributing paper packets at food sites that were by grade, but not by school and weren't modified. So children with special education needs couldn't get to them, neither could families that weren't able to get to the food sites. And so what we see is that school districts that were already equipped and had lots of funding were able to pivot seamlessly. So it's really easy to get started up on Zoom if you already have a device in every single one of your students' hands and you have a counselor who can connect and you have social workers and you have a nurse that can explain the risks um, and how to keep yourself safe during an ongoing active pandemic. But what we saw is that children of color particularly were being denied the ability to even access school because there weren't those resources. So we see learning gaps and opportunity gaps where children have missed out on whole school years. And so now what we have is students who are attending under-resourced schools that don't have what they need that are now dealing with the pandemic and are now dealing with all of the behavioral challenges, the challenges that have been happening. And also let us not forget that while the pandemic was happening, there were horrific acts of um, anti-Black violence, police killings, um, tons of violence against communities of color. And so families are then bringing that trauma to school. And so what we've seen is that schools are less equipped now because there's also less resources to meet students' needs, but there is important federal funding that has come in. And some schools are doing a really nice job um, making spaces that are effective in the pandemic. And I think our next speaker might have some good examples. I was really floored on the way over just the difference between some of the schools that I was seeing and the examples and really innovations, things that were done, like putting hotspots in buses, right? And driving them to locations where there was internet. So happy to chat more about that offline. I could go on forever. Professor Lee? Um. I was kind of struck. Um, it seems like, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, you know, is very shocking. But then then there's my response of, um, well, but you can call the Education Law Center and they'll fix it so I don't have to worry about it. Um, so I was kind of I was kind of interested, which I know is an unrealistic response. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the demands on your services and kind of like a day in the life of, you know, Paige as, as an attorney at Education Law Center and, you know, you seem like a sane person, doesn't drive you crazy. Get mental health support. It's key to sustainability. <laughs> um, public interest work is really tough. I represent clients who look like me who are facing racism and face some of the same education violations that I faced as a black girl learning in Idaho school. So this work is heart project for me. It is justice work. I think it is transformative work. Love it. It doesn't mean it's always easy. Um, education Law Center, I really love. And it's like, I, you, I could spend days talking about how much I love my job, which is really great because I know not everybody loves their job. So you can feel free to grab me offline if you want to know more. But we do policy work. We do impact litigation, which is suing for systems change, like the William Penn litigation, the school funding case. And then I do a lot of direct representation. So I represent individual kids and individual families who are facing barriers and try to get justice for them in the way that looks like justice for them. So I have conversations about like what it is, what do you need in order for your school to be better? And I have these conversations with really small children. And you know what? They're able to tell me. And I'm often the first person that asks. It should not be a lawyer is the first person to be asking people, but it often is. I then do policy work. So I testify in front of school boards about discriminatory dress code. And people are shocked and horrified and don't know these things are in their student handbooks, but they're approving them. Their boards put them in there. Somebody wrote them, right? So holding accountability that way, I get to do know your rights presentations where I give information and rights-based information to families and students about what to do, what their rights are when you call a lawyer. 
And so a day in my life looks like a lot of different things. This morning, I was obviously finishing my PowerPoint. I was emailing a client. I Later after I get off the train, I'll be in meetings for a few hours. And then the, tonight I'll be drafting some responses to a case I'm working on that implicates Title IX. And so the thing I really like about my job is it's dynamic and it's ever changing. And when you look at individual cases, you really do get to tinker with the system in a way that helps that individual young person. And I'm one that likes to see results. I think that my favorite part of my job is attending graduations. I am always screaming and I'm always sobbing because it's such an impactful time to get to see a young person who you have served take the stage and be honored for their accomplishment. And like, I would be, I wouldn't, I have a lot that I want to do in my career, but I knew that every single second of law school, which was not easy for me. And I like cried most of it those three years, but it was worth it when I saw my first student take the stage and I have this picture on my wall. So anytime I'm thinking I'm tired, I remember that I have a lot more energy, but get mental health support, super important. We don't talk about it. And I wouldn't be able to do my job and perform at a high level if I didn't get the support I needed for myself and self-care. Can you please talk about the intersectionality of race, sexual orientation, and poverty in your yeah. work? So when we look at students and we look at the educational environments that they are in, we find that students who are people who have identities that are targeted by oppressive systems, those things are intersectional. So when I call, when I get a call from a family, it's not like a single issue easy thing because people don't live single issue lives, right? It's that the bus isn't coming, the student needs a specialized bus to get to school to meet their mobility needs. They also might be experiencing discrimination on the basis of their race and their sexual orientation. So what we see is those harms compound and the harms compound not because there's anything about that child or that young person or that young adult, but because our systems harm people. And so what we see is that it's not just harm on one identity, it's like they intersect with each other and that those harms inform each other differently. So take the example of dress code. Um, the school district of Philadelphia has a policy called 252. It was created in part by young people who are advocates and organizations in the community that noticed that people were being discriminated against on the basis of their gender expression and identity. And so now the school code shouldn't have boy uniforms and girl uniforms. It should be like you have a range of things that you can put on your body. But we know when I get calls, it's like the school is disciplining me for wearing my literal uniform because of my body shape or the way it looks or because I'm expressing my gender or my culture or my heritage. <laughs> and so those things compound. And so what it's very easy for decision makers to do is say, well, it wasn't because of that one thing that you were discriminated against. It has nothing to do with that. But if you distill those things down, what you're going to find is the students that are least well served are also our community members that are least well served because systems intersect with each other. So black girls are discriminated against because they are black and because they are girls. And because we have so little research, that's why Education Law Center has that particular focus. And that's why I do the work that I do, because it's important to sort of tease out both of those things. That was probably a longer answer than you wanted, and I'm sorry for that. Thank you so much. I believe we are out of time. Thank you so much. And I'll be around later if you want to chat. Thank you all. We'll take a break now and reconvene at 1125. Zoom our uh, forum here. Um, in this hour, um, we have a couple of uh, speakers with us. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you Ian Rowe, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility family formation and adoption. Mr. Rowe is also the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools opening in the Bronx this year, 2022. He is the chairman of the board of Spence Chapman, a nonprofit adoption services organization, and the co-founder of the National Summer School Initiative. He concurrently serves as a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and a writer, a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. Mr. Rowe formerly served as the CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of public charter schools based in the South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan. Before joining Public Prep, 
He was Deputy Director of Post-Secondary Success at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Public Affairs at MTV, Director of Strategy and Performance Measurement at the USA Freedom Corps Office in the White House, and Co-Founder and President of Third Millennium Media. Mr. Rowe also joined Teach for America in its early days. He has been widely published in the popular press, including the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Examiner. He is often interviewed on talk radio programs. His latest book, Agency, is set to be released this May by Temple Templeton Press, seeks to inspire young people of all races to build strong families and become masters of their own destiny. Mr. Rowe has an MBA from Harvard Business School where he was the first black editor-in-chief of The Harvest, the Harvard Business School newspaper. He has a BS in computer science engineering from Cornell University and a diploma in electrical engineering from Brooklyn Technical High School, a school which specializes in science, technology, and mathematics, and continues to be regarded as one of New York City's elite public schools. So welcome, Mr. Rowe. I would also like to introduce Anthony Cox Jr., who currently practices law in the Harrisburg office of Eckerd Siemens, where he specializes in a wide variety of complex commercial and business litigation matters, as well as professional liability and professional and occupational licensure defense matters. Anthony has argued both uh, before state and federal courts, as well as both before state and federal agencies including the Pennsylvania Department of State, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. His appellate experience includes handling matters on appeal before the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, the Superior Court of Pennsylvania, and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Mr. Cox is a member of the Board of Directors of the Dauphin County Bar Association, and is co-chair of the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Minority Bar Committee. He is also the Third Circuit Representative to the Federal Bar Association's Young Lawyers Division. He has been frequently recognized for his courtroom, professional, and community efforts, most recently being included among the nation's Black lawyers' top 40 under 40, and Pennsylvania Super Lawyers' Rising Stars. The PBA has honored Mr. Cox with the 2021 Diversity and Inclusion Award and the 2018 Minority Bar Committee Rising Stars Attorney Award. And even with all of that, we are most proud to say that he is a graduate of Widener University Commonwealth School of Law. Um, he serves on both the uh, Law School's Alumni Association Board and the Dean's Diversity Board of Advisors. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Cox. And now it's my pleasure to turn over the podium to Mr. Rowe for his remarks. Good afternoon, and thank you for that, uh, that kind introduction. Uh, based on some of the things I heard this morning, I've actually decided to change uh, uh, my remarks and, and, and begin with I think a personal story that will help to frame uh, the comments I make uh, going forward. So, uh, so my parents uh, are from uh, Jamaica, West Indies. Um, they, uh, they came to this country in the mid 1960s. Uh, they came at a time when uh, the country was going through an enormous amount of racial strife, as you might imagine. Um, they were quite clear of the country's history on racial segregation, slavery, uh, but they also knew that the country was changing. You know, there was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and they knew that there was still enormous opportunity. Um, they weren't running away from Jamaica, West Indies, they were running towards the United States and what it stood for. And, um, and my parents always had this motto that there are opportunities here. The key is that we need to make sure that you're prepared when those opportunities present themselves. 
So uh, initially we lived in Brooklyn um, on Wyona Street. Um, and uh, if you remember the Jeffersons, we, we ultimately moved on up uh, to Queens. Uh, we moved to a small town in Laurelton, um, small uh, area of Queens called Laurelton, which at the time was a predominantly Jewish, Italian, predominantly white um, part of Queens. And it was slowly becoming uh, more racially integrated, um, which unfortunately led to uh, more uh, racial incidents um, to the point where there was so much activity at the junior high school that I was now attending junior high school 231, which again had been uh, predominantly white, but it was now much more racially mixed and more racial tension. And so the school board decided to solve this problem by opening an annex, uh, another junior high school in Rosedale, Queens, which was a, a town a few miles over, which was more predominantly, predominantly and permanently white. And so what happened was that all of the parents in our junior high school 231, all the white parents, essentially chose to take their kids out of our school and move them to the annex. And so basically leaving our junior high school as an you know, all, all black uh, segregated school. And my parents, uh, on the presumption that where the white kids go, that's where the better education will go, wanted to take me out of um, junior high school 231. And I will always remember the Sunday night before the transfer papers had to be submitted. We were in our living room and you know, my dad was on his recliner. My mom was on the couch, like, you know, often when we, when we sat together in the living room. Um, and I begged my parents for me to stay at junior high school 231. I said, you know, why? Why just because if all the kids that are left are black, why does that have to be worse? Or why does that have to be bad? You know, I'll work really hard. I love my teachers. I love going to school. Why, 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 why should I have to leave? And I mean, it's, it was the first time I'd ever challenged my parents about anything, right? Because, you know, my parents would crawl through broken glass for good things to happen to their kids, um, but something didn't feel right about this particular experience. And I stood up, you know, I was 12 years old. And uh, ultimately my parents relented and they let me stay. And, you know, in some ways I felt what I now describe as a feeling of agency, which I'll talk about shortly, um, the sense that I can influence my outcomes in my life. Like there's, there's something I want, um, really strongly with the support of my parents, in this case, in a good school, which I thought of my 231 still was, I could do great things. I didn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't have called it then, but that's what I felt. I, I felt a much greater sense of ownership and responsibility around my own education. And I'm convinced, you know, and I went on, I went to Brooklyn Tech and Cornell and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I, I got, I had a great K to 12 public education. And, you know, had I gone to that other school, would I have had the same level of ownership and responsibility and determination? I don't know, but I am convinced that that experience has informed how I think about virtually every aspect, particularly as it relates to education, that the demographics of a school, whether it's segregated by race, that actually should have nothing to do with the level of expectation, the level of rigor, the level of excellence that embodies that school. And it has certainly um, influenced me to, that very, to this very day. So I thought that was a um, important sort of opening personal story to ground uh, my comments. Um, as the Dean uh, expressed, you know, I'm currently a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I, I wear lots of different hats. The hat I think that's most relevant for this conversation is my hat as a school leader. And so for the last 10 years, I was the CEO of Public Prep, which is a nonprofit network of all girls and all boys uh, public charter schools, uh, elementary and middle schools. We had 2,000 kids um, in our five campuses, um, uh, uh, about 2,000 students, uh, almost all black and almost Hispanic, oh, sorry, almost all black and Hispanic, almost all low income. Um, 
And uh, it was amazing. I mean, what's well, although I have to say we had nearly 5,000 kids on our wait list. So imagine, you know, we do a lottery every year um, to, you know, cause there's no, there's no selection process. There's some geographic preference. If you live in the projects, for example, do you have a higher chance of getting in? But, you know, every year when we added new seats, we had lots of applications. So it was really exciting to call the hundreds of parents to say, yes, your child has gotten the golden ticket. Um, you've gotten in, but it's brutal. It is crushing. It is bittersweet to call nearly 5,000 families or to send them a note to say that the best we can do is to offer your child, you know, a site of a slot on a very long wait list. And this is in a school district in district eight in the South Bronx, where in 2015 of about the 2000 students that started ninth grade, four years later, only 2% graduated from high school ready for college. Meaning that they started ninth grade in the year 2015. And then after that, they either dropped out or they actually did earn their high school diploma in 2019, but still could not do math nor reading without remediation if they were to go to college, like, which is worse, right? You start ninth grade and you drop out or you actually finish the expectations of the school that you attend and you still cannot compete. To me, that's criminal. Um, and it, it, it places into context. So when we look at all these numbers as adults, like why aren't there more black and Hispanic kids in law school? Why aren't there more black and Hispanic CEOs? It's, if you're starting with those sorts of outcomes coming out of K to 12, all the back end band-aids in the world are not gonna solve these upfront issues. And so I did that for 10 years. And, you know, we did some great things. I, we can talk about what we did during COVID. You know, we, we, you know, we have a number of kids that were in homeless um, shelters. We set up, um, literally, we, we went into the homeless shelters to set up learning environments so kids could actually have remote access, um, even uh, during COVID in, you know, in, in very, very challenging circumstances. We set up uh, Wi-Fi hotspots and housing projects. We set up um, organic food um, locations for pickups, not only for our students, but we also placed them near um, some of the hospitals so that the kids of the first responders could get access to food. So there's a ton of stuff that we were doing to ensure this idea of equal access um, to high quality learning. And in that case, high quality Wi-Fi, high quality food um, to do whatever we could. Um, but doing that for 10 years, you know, we, our schools went through eighth grade and, you know, we, I mean, I'm very proud to say that some of our kids have now not only graduated from high school, now college, places like Yale and Tufts and Howard. So we're very proud of the accomplishments of our students. But the fact is, when we graduated our kids from eighth grade, in places like the Bronx, it's like an abyss in terms of high quality high school options. And so not that there aren't some great high schools, but they're so oversubscribed, it is very, very, very difficult. No matter how great work you do through eighth grade, you, you face this challenge. So, so I'm going back in. Um, and as Dean said, this later this year, we're launching a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools um, that will be grounded in the principles of equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and our common humanity. All um, focused on the cardinal virtues of courage, justice, wisdom, and temperance. And the school is interesting on multiple levels, one of which is that um, similar like when I went to Brooklyn Tech High School, we had 14 majors that you could choose from. So I majored in electrical engineering in high school. So within Vertex Partnership Academies, our new school, a student at the end of 10th grade will either be able to choose the International Baccalaureate Diploma pathway, which means that they can have a more traditional college or university path, or they can choose the International Baccalaureate Careers pathway. And that pathway is designed so that you can earn, you can, uh, earn an industry credential with labor market value coming out of high school. So, you know, we're in discussions with the Mayo Clinic to have a course of study on phlebotomy so you can be a phlebotomist, um, you know, and earn 100, 150 bucks an hour coming out of high school. We'll have computer science as a pathway, architecture slash construction, 
something in media and then healthcare um, with Mayo. So it's a very innovative model. And again, this is in a district where only 2% of kids are graduating from high school ready for college. So we are very excited. We're gonna build a 100,000 square foot facility, beautiful to deal with issues of the facilities, especially many of the facilities in the Bronx are dilapidated. We already built um, an 85,000 square foot building for our all boys school right on Grand Concourse in the South Bronx, one of the most dangerous areas in the South Bronx. So facilities matter a lot as well. And yet, to give you a sense of the opposition, the teachers union has just sued us to try and block the creation of this school. And we can talk about the, happy to go into the details of it. It's a baseless lawsuit. Um, and yet it's just one of the um, um, very real pieces of evidence of how difficult it is to break the status quo especially when the opposition is coming from people who constantly claim that they're interested in the interests of very low income uh, black and brown kids. That's what makes it even harder. Again, happy to talk this through, but we're gonna win and we're gonna, you know, school is starting on August 22nd and it's gonna be, it's gonna be one of the best high schools in the country, right? So determined to fight the status quo. So all this to be said is I think a lot about the challenges facing young people in our country, not just black kids, but young people across the country. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that there are these um, two dominant narratives that I think young people are just being um, suppressed by. The first dominant narrative I call blame the, vic blame the system. And then the other I call blame the victim. And the blame the system narrative, that's the narrative that paints America as this permanently oppressive nation. That based on your race, your gender, your gender identity, some characteristic that you are inherently oppressed and that the systems are rigged against you, like capitalism itself is evil, that there's a white supremacist lurking on every corner, that there's just this overwhelming set of systems that have these um, discriminatory powers embedded within them. And that's, that's just the way it's been, that's the way it is now. And then without some massive government redistribution or discrimination in a different way, you are helpless as a young person to overcome these systemic forces. That's what I call blame the system. Blame the victim you know, goes to the other extreme, which is that America is great. You know, America is the land of opportunity. America is this place where, you know, just walking down the street, you can make a million dollars, right? Um, I say that a little bit facetiously, but the idea being that America is so rich in opportunity that if you are not successful, it's your fault, right? It's some pathology that you have created for yourself that's standing in the way that you have created your own barrier to not take advantage of these opportunities. So that's what I call blame the victim. And to some degree, in my view, both of these half truths add up to a lie that robs young people of agency, the belief that they can actually control their own destiny. And I define agency as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. The force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So agency is um, it's like a vector, like velocity, right? Velocity is not just speed, it's speed and direction, right? So each one of us has the ability to make decisions in our lives. The question is, that's your free will. The question is how, What's helping you determine what those decisions should be for the maximum output of your own life so that you can lead a life of flourishing? And so I have, because you never want to come to a conversation like this without your own proposed solution. I find oftentimes um, we, we talk a lot about the issues, but what's the compelling and empowering alternative? And so I have thought that young people need a new framework, a new framework that helps 
ensure that they understand that they do have the ability to overcome the institutional barriers that the blame the system people say are insurmountable while also saying that there are institutions that can support them that the blame the victim people constantly ignore, right? Kids can't do this. You know, agency is individually practiced, but socially empowered. So my new framework, and I'll, I'll close with this and we can talk about it. I'll close with my new framework I call free. Because I think these are the four pillars that if young people were to embrace, it gives them the best shot to have a chance to lead a life of human flourishing. And FREE stands for family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. Family as sort of the bedrock for our society, for human flourishing in my own life, and I'm sure, um, for everyone, family is not the family that you're from, it's the family that you form. So helping young people understand what are the rewards or consequences associated with different series of life decisions as they make their passage into young adulthood. So for example, there's a term, there's a terminology called a success sequence. Some of you may know, may not, may know that term, but it's data that says if a young person finishes just a high school degree, then gets a full-time job of any kind, just so they learn the dignity and discipline of work. And then if they have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials avoid poverty. Not a guarantee, but that's an enormous and important piece of information that young people should know as they start to think about, and we started, uh, talking about these issues in eighth grade, and we'll certainly be talking about it in grades nine through 12 in high school. That's a powerful piece of information as young people think about, as I think towards my future and family, that's the kind of content that should be taught, we believe, in every kind of scholastic setting, and honestly, not just in schools, but other institutions that interact with kids. What are the, what are the decisions that are coming towards you? Because ultimately, this is not being told in a prescriptive fashion, it's being told descriptively. Here are the different pathways of decisions that you can make. Here are the likely outcomes based on this set of pathways, this set of pathways, this set of pathways. You decide, you're the owner of your life. But without having good, accurate information, you may not make the best decisions as it relates to your individual life. The R in free is religion. And this, it's an interesting one. I mean, the data is overwhelming that having a personal faith commitment in your life leads to all sorts of better outcomes um, in health, um, family, uh, education. In fact, there's a, a new book that just came out. I think it's called God, Grades, and Graduation, which talks about the role of religion in um, advancing better educational outcomes. It's a very interesting read. Um, you should take a look at it. Um, now, of course, this is a time when religiosity is actually in decline, particularly amongst young people. But my hope is to revitalize that a faith commitment can be a source of huge power. And what's interesting is that, you know, John McWhorter has a great book out right now called Woke Racism, where he actually compares things like anti-racism and critical race theory as a religion in the sense of it's filling this void for many young people who are searching for some answers to the question of why the world is the way they are. And it's almost like you can be excommunicated if you don't follow every single tenet of what is often called um, you know, woke ideology. So that's our this personal faith commitment. Um, e for education, it's all about school choice. I mean, those 5,000 families in the South Bronx that we were talking to, how would you feel if you were a 24-year-old mom you have a five-year-old, no matter what you may have done in your own life, you want your child to have a great shot. And the best you can do is send your child to a school where you know that only 2% of kids over the long term are gonna graduate from high school ready for college. It's fundamental. Um, so it's gotta be part of any policy prescription, um, where we're talking about advancement for kids of all races, but particularly low-income kids in communities like in the South Bronx or Appalachia or Chicago or Los Angeles 
lots of places where there is not educational opportunity. And then the last E is entrepreneurship. So if you've got a strong family that you're forming, strong faith commitment, strong educational options, then what do you do with all that? Well, E is entrepreneurship, which includes work, which is so important, um, but it also means being the owner of your life, being a problem solver, and understanding how to generate wealth. In the high school that we're launching, every ninth grader through a partnership with Charles Schwab, Charles Schwab Company, through their fractional shares, if you're familiar with stock splits, so for $5, you can own a piece of Apple or Walmart or Google. So every ninth grader will have a stock portfolio of 10 S&P 500 stocks. And you know, every quarter, <laughs> they'll be looking at their statement and say, wait, why did these earnings go up? Why did these earnings go down? Why do, why do some companies pay dividends and not? And so if they have a, an iPhone, they, they can know that they're not just a consumer, but they're actually an owner of that company. And what does that mean? How do you help young people start to believe that they, they're not just passive recipients of a system, but they can be the architects of that system? And we often had this idea that America, you know, I say is a good, if not great country. But the, the distance from good to great isn't just some automatic thing. You're a participant. You're the one that actually helps to traverse that distance between good and great. So how do you develop the sense of ownership? So maybe I'll stop there. That's the framework I'm putting forth that I'm trying to get young people to embrace in a new way. Family, religion, education, entrepreneurship. If you want to lead a life of freedom. Those are the pillars, these pillars of free that I think will yield enormous benefit um, to the rising generation. Thank you. Okay, well, we're gonna have um, a little shift. We're gonna have a discussion here. So we're gonna have a little shift in format. We're gonna come out front um, and then have a little conversation about uh, Mr. Rose remarks and all of that. So if, Anthony, if you wanna grab that chair and bring it around, we got a couple over here. All right, so a little chance to um, talk some more about um, your ideas here and where you left us um, just now in the in your opening remarks. But before we got there, I want to give Anthony a chance. Um, I mean, if there's anything that he would like to add or share on his philosophy of education that, you know, has formed him that would be um, uh, useful and helpful for this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I um, really agree 100% with what Mr. Rose said. And I think that I'm a, a practical example of that. You know, I, I come from a single parent household where my mom did not finish high school. Um, and yet I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a successful lawyer now. And I think I as a young, as I got older, mentors taught me that it's not about where you come from, but it's where you want to be. And that's why that, you know, the, the F and free really sticks with me. And I have some questions for Mr. Rowe on that um, for the panel, but you know, it, it was about reminding myself what I want to do, what and making decisions that are going to help me. So, you know, while my friends may have chose to go out and do things that they shouldn't have done, I chose to not do that. So I, I think the model, I'm a, I'm a really good practical example of it. And, it, and I think I really like that. I never thought about um, it that way, but kind of hearing it and, and watching my life evolve, I can see that that's kind of some of the principles I apply. So I really, I think it's important. I also agree with the educational piece, you know, um, for me, sometimes I used to get kind of frustrated when, um, you know, I had a cousin, um, I grew up in New York and I had a cousin who he lived in the suburban part of New York and I didn't. And sometimes I, even in sports, is this even get, it even got to the point where we play sports against his, his team. And I'd say, man, you all have more resources than we have. You know, we don't have any of that. We're using some of the older school books and I'll, I'll tell a personal struggle. Even when I got to law school, I struggled a little bit with reading comprehension, right? And I ended up doing well and, and finishing at the top of the class, but I struggled. Like there would be times I'm reading cases and I'll talk to my, my classmates and I'd say, man, I didn't get that out of that. 
I didn't get that out of that case. And I'm sure you all can, can, can send me that. And I say, man, I don't know what I did, but that's not what I got out of this case. <laughs> and I was learning that I was, I was kind of playing from behind a little bit um, because my schools I went to were doing the best that they could with the resource they had. But, you know, I was trying to catch up, you know, where I had roommates, my roommate, he read a case in five minutes. He got it. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. It was taking me three, three, four hours. And I think a professor, um, it might even been Professor Lee, Professor Hemingway said, hey, it's not all, it's going to take some time in the beginning to adjust. And, and all lawyers go through that. And, and so eventually I got it. And now I can read cases in five minutes and do that. So it's I, I, what I really took from that, I want you all to take from it for me, who's kind of a practical example of this philosophy. It's about where you want to get. So you have to sometimes separate yourself from what circumstances you went through, um, what circumstances you're in, and try to think about what you want to get. And I think that's kind of how you break this blame the system or blame the victim rule. Think about what, what do I want, where do I want to get, and how can I get there? Thank you, Anthony. That's uh, uh, for sharing that. That's really helpful to our discussion. And 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 thank you for sharing that. I mean, one one comment. Um, one of the reasons that people, some people, oppose the idea of talking about ideas like it's not about the family that you're from, it's about the family you form, this idea of a forward looking orientation. Some people are opposed to the, this idea of even talking about things like this series of decisions, right? Because, you know, education, work, marriage, and children is not the pathway that everyone has chosen obviously, right? And, and in your case, like you just said, you had a single mom. So there, there are folks who, are, who will say, wait a minute, we can't teach that to Anthony in high school because, you know, Anthony's mom didn't make that decision. We don't want to um, somehow, you know, um, embarrass or make, you know, Anthony or, you know, you know what I'm saying, uncomfortable and so let's not teach it at all, right? So let's, let's just avoid the topic. And, and one of the things we thought about was like, okay, well, we, that's clearly not the intent, right? When you're talking about these very sensitive issues, but the fact is family structure does play a huge role in so many of the outcomes that many of us care about later in life. And so we said, okay, well, maybe what we should do is before we talk to students, let's have a class with parents to say, you entered the lottery for our school system on the belief that we were going to teach your children those sets of skills, behaviors that we think are more likely to lead to success. Well, guess what? This is one of the things we wanna talk about, this series of decisions, not in a prescriptive way, because we're not saying you must do this. We're saying here, here, it's almost like a probabilities class based on these decisions. And one of the things we heard back from parents primarily those who had not followed this set of decisions in their own life, was that, thank heavens, someone is saying this to my kids. I wish someone had uh, taught this to me when I was growing up. So it's just an interesting thing. Oftentimes when we're having discussions about the very people we're seeking to serve and educate, there's a lot of you know, pontification or theories that don't actually align with the very people who are day-to-day -day living in communities looking for the strategies to have a better life, especially for their children. Sure. Um, you know, and as I was thinking in some about what you were, um, you know, talking about there on the, uh, the timing issue. And so, I mean, your example a minute ago was about somebody who I think was 22 or thereabout, you know, and had a, a young child in this educational system. Um, you know, in terms of getting that message and the uh, free that information communicated to them, how, how do we go about getting that information out at a time when it can make a, a significant um, or have a significant effect on children coming up? I mean, it's a very difficult question. You're a 24 year old and you have a five year old child. The time is now. You know, you you don't have time for the system to somehow self correct, especially given that it's been trying to self correct for a very long time. That's why I think you see more and more parents. I mean, what's been interesting since uh, COVID, you know, the, the rates of um, homeschooling have dramatically in increased, particularly in the Black community. The rates of uh, um, 
enrollment into Catholic schools has also really uh, increased. You've seen a, a significant drop in traditional public schools. Charter schools are, I think, growing up. And by the way, charter schools are public schools. <laughs> Just to um, note that. Because I think parents are urgently wanting better options for their kids today. And one of the things with COVID is that when they were looking over their kid's shoulder during the Zoom lessons, they weren't that happy with what they were seeing. And so um, that's why I, you know, I fundamentally believe parental choice and education has is, is got to be the first rung. I mean, again, so many issues we care about, incarceration, wealth gaps, I mean, all the things down the road. If our kids are coming out of our K-12 systems, and by the way, this is kids of all races. I'm only 37% of all kids in America. Are reading at grade level, right? So this is this is white, black. Um, you know, it's it, it's a it's what I call the equal opportunity tsunami. Um, how can we expect there to be all this opportunity? Well, the opportunity is there, but not everyone is prepared to take advantage of these opportunities down the road. Yeah, and, and you know, piggybacking on that on that, you know, I, I I gave an example of my struggle at law school at the law school level, and so sometimes like my struggle is. How, who can I tell this? Well, how do, I don't know how if I can go tell someone I couldn't understand what just happened in the case, you know, because that should I even be here? You know, that was so that was one of my struggles. And to the point that um, Ms. Rowe made with, with my mom's a good example of that my mom never really pushed education um, on me. She just kind of her thing was just stay alive. And I, and I mean that like sincerely. But when people did come to her and speak about education, like, for example, we had a neighbor that moved in and, and they were sending their kids to the, the charter schools and which were the better schools where I was living at. And my mom was a lot. She liked that. So when she was she was open to that. So she, when she heard those things, she was open to it. And here in Harrisburg, we have something called the something called the nativity school, which I volunteer at. And it's a school that um, it's a middle school. And it's really to help underprivileged young black men. And when I go to we, they do the principal does home visits because, you know, we go sometimes visit the parents and. The parents may have not always made the best decisions, but they will be open um, to um, better lives for their kids. And I guess my, that kind of poses my question for you, Mr. Rowe, which is how can a, how can a person, you know, break what, what, what often is called as a generational curse? So you come from a underprivileged family. Um, you may not have your family pushing you in this right direction, but you want to go in that direction. And maybe you're surrounded by friends who don't want to go that direction. So, you know, what, how, how can a person break that? And what can people who, who come from privileged homes, what can they do to help um, others break those, those, gener those quote unquote general curses? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. I mean, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is that we never frame it as an intergenerational curse in the sense of even that word, that framing is starting with this, like you're starting at the deficit, right? You're starting with this mindset that's like, my family is plagued with this curse. And we, and by the way, we did home visits too. So every single family, we, we, you know, it's like the mountain goes to Muhammad, right? So it wasn't that uh, the kids had to come to us. We went to home visits to every single family, sit in their living room, to usually two teachers, um, sometimes a teacher and the principal of the, of the school. And we sit with the child and the parent. And we had this agreement. We called it the commitment to college completion. I don't know what we're going to, call it for our high school, but, um, but this idea that we all, we, and it was around our core values. So there were things that a parent does that represent in our, in, in our K to eight schools, we were about um, responsibility, responsibility, merit, scholarship, and either brotherhood or sisterhood for our all girls or all boys schools. And, but on, under each one of those, like responsibility, you know, you have to, you have to read this number of minutes per night, or you have to do your homework, or, you know, you have to attend certain, you know, parent volunteer meetings, but all that was in this agreement. And it was signed by the student, by the parent, um, and the teacher and the principal. Right? And so that was somewhat symbolic, but it, it was a moment. It's a ritual where everyone says we lock hands together. The school can't do it alone. Parents part of the uh, uh, the solution. Child is integral, um, and so there we say again: no matter what situation you're in, there are assets to be maximized in this home. And I hear you, man. I mean, look, I've there there are uh, places that we've gone to visit, and the projects, and other places. You would think, oh my God, how can learning happen here? But learning can happen here. 
you know, it's not about the family that you're from or the situation that you're from, it's what you form. And we have to, and I'm not saying this is easy, um, but without a future orientation, without a sense of what you have the ability to accomplish, you are then actually um, maybe perpetuating a, a something almost like a curse because you, you, you create a perception that like, this is just the way it is. And we just cannot, um, we just cannot succumb to that, that way of thinking. And Ian, when you were talking a minute ago, you were talking about um, the contract that was signed, outlining what the, the parent had to do and what the child had to do. Um, and the school as well on all of that. I'm curious, um, you know, in this broader education question, um, what thoughts you have about the role of um, community leaders and lawyers um, in, in that process as well? I mean, we have you know, lawyers here, we have law students here, um, among others, but, uh, you know, I know from our experience here that, uh, that there are Likely people here that'll end up on school boards um, as elected officials. They'll be on boards of nonprofit schools or charter, uh, um, not charter, uh, nonprofit schools like that, um, or involved in those activities. Um, what, what's their yeah. role? Yeah, also a good question. Um, you know, schools have to school. <laughs> One of the dangers of running schools in communities that have so many needs is that the school itself tries to take on a lot of these activities. So there are things like community schools where you'll literally have dental clinics. You'll, you, like you'll try to build all of these things in. And on the surface, that's generally a good thing. However, sometimes it becomes mission creep where you lose sight of the academics. That is the, is the central thing that you're trying to do. Um, legal is interesting because like, for example, we, the, the teachers union has now filed lawsuit against us. And so we're looking for a pro bono counsel to defend us. And we think we're gonna get it. And again, we think we're gonna get the case dismissed. Um, but that certainly is one way. I mean, <laughs> in the public charter school world, um, you know, the legal apparatus uh, for schools is very necessary because there, there is definitely a constituency that is very hostile to um, the public charter school world. I mean, but it's important, you know, the, the legal, so, so not only lawyers, but legislators. So, um, so for example, in New York City, Bill de Blasio, the former mayor of New York City, when he was running for mayor, in 2013, he declared his opposition to public charter schools. And he said he was gonna turn over a move that Mike Bloomberg, the former mayor had done years before, which was basically, you had all these uh, public schools that had uh, empty space, you had excess. Um, um, and so Mike Bloomberg said, you know what? Rather than have that space go unused, let's allow high-performing charter schools to apply to be able to uh, enter those schools, which was amazing. It's what allowed the sector to go basically from 10 schools to now there are more than I think 250 uh, public charter schools in New York City. But when de Blasio became mayor, he said, no, 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 I'm going to start charging rent to public charter schools so that you'd have to take about 30 to 40% of your per pupil. And instead of investing that in education, you would actually have to pay it back to the government as rent. It was a crazy idea, but he won, Bill de Blasio won and said, I'm now moving forward. And so we organized lawyers, parents to advocate to the state legislature to say, this is an injustice. These are public school kids. Um, they should be in public school buildings. And so the legislature on the advice of a lot of our lawyers said, well, this is the remedy for this is if New York City um, says that if a charter school is growing, it's gonna deny access to public school space, then an additional uh, public funding stream has to be created for that charter school to go rent private space. And so that's what happened. So, that, so now in New York City, there's an additional funding stream per charter school kids of 30% of per pupil. So meaning that New York, New York City per pupil is about $17,000, which I know in many places, that's an enormous amount of money, which it is. But now we get an additional $5,100 per kid forever if you uh, rent private facilities. The reason that's significant, you know, to the point um, that Paige made earlier, um, that uh, there are all these dilapidated buildings, we're now able to go out and build 
brand new facilities by saying our school, which might have 800 kids at capacity, can have $4 million per year in rent allocation. So there are a lot of developers who will say, wow, that's fantastic. Let's build a brand new building in the heart of the South Bronx. And that's what we've done. Um, and that was all based on um, lawyers and legal assistance. So there are a lot of ways that lawyers can come into the game to help create access, um, to help change laws, like creating more school choice, running for school board. I ran for school board and one, I'm now on the school board of my own hometown, also very important. So lawyers can have a, a great role to play to allow schools to just be school, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Like I don't want schools to suddenly become, now they're taking on all sorts of other challenges. It's like, it's like the offensive line in a football, like they try to do everything they can to let the quarterback do their thing. That's what I feel like the, the law, the lawyers are, they're part of the offensive line and the school is the quarterback to try and get it done. Um, and, and thank you for that. And kind of piggybacking and growing up, expanding on that, you know, as you know, you know, the further you get, you know, the, the, the students that have those forward, that, that forward way of thinking and they become successful, which a lot of them do, um, the further you go in life, you know, it, it seems like the further you get from where you came from. So when you go to law school, you know, if you're a, a young black uh, boy or girl who came from the inner city, you're probably not going to see as many people like that if you become successful at a law firm. So my question is, how do you recommend, how do you keep that way of forward thinking when you get to law school, you made it here, you made it to medical school, law school, engineering, you made it to a law firm, you made it as a judge, but you look around and maybe you don't have some of the same resources or you don't feel you have some of the same resources that you, you may have had. So how do you kind of keep that way of forward thinking once you've quote unquote made it? Yeah, well, first of all, I never think I've made it, right? Because life is so fragile, you know, so many things can be lost very quickly. So it's, a, I feel like I'm always working, but it, it's an interesting question because I would love to believe that most of the people in this room, as you become successful, you will have a piece of your life dedicated to helping those um, who are coming up that may have not had the same access and resources you did. You can't always count on it. So for me, that's why the school itself is so important. So our school curriculum is going to be designed in such a way that we're exposing kids to lots of different industries, career paths, interesting people. Like I want you to come speak at our school. <laughs> I haven't told you that yet. Um, no, but you know, it, it's like the, the K to 12 education has to be designed in such a way that it's helping young people understand that their, their world goes beyond the world that they're in. And by the way, that doesn't mean we want you to leave the South Bronx or the Lower East Side or some other poor community. You, you can make your own community great too, you know? So, um, but oftentimes it does seem like our kids range of experiences just narrows their aperture. And um, I would love it if more people decided to go back and mentor and start schools and, um, and that is happening, but at the scale that we need, the school itself has to know that that is part of its job to accomplish. Well, let's um, open it up here and see what questions we might have from those here and get the laptop to see if we have folks online with questions as well. I think it's an unproductive exercise. Oh, oh the, um, the question was, That is solution oriented. So in blame the system that if you have a worldview that the system is just so heavy and so rigged and so oppressive, you've just got no shot. It's, it's almost like you're gasping for breath. And in blame the victim, it's like, well, it's your fault. Why didn't you do what you, you know, why didn't you do the work? Um, and in my view, I call them half truths because there's certain elements of both. But when you add them up, they add up to a lie. So the question is, what is the empowering alternative? And for me, I don't believe it's a singular, you know, government must do all the work, nor do I believe it's singular. Well, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, young man, you should just do this. It's not those. That's not how humanity works.
you're looking at it from the perspective of a movement to push for social change. So the question is, am I looking at this from uh, an individual perspective or from the perspective of institutions that have to force social change? So, sorry, is that better? Okay, so my free framework, I believe is both in the sense of every, agency is the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So it's a combination of free will, which is individual, but moral discernment, where does that come from, right? What are the institutions that help form character? What are the institutions that help you develop the skills that make it so that you can make the decisions like probably most people or their parents made in this room to get to this point where you're now on a trajectory to probably lead the life of your choosing, whatever you want that to be. So it's a combination of individual because sometimes, you know, in the blame the system ideology, there's no room for the individual. Like you're, you're literally, you're just a recipient of, you're just a, a you're just a cog in this larger machine that's operating at some level above you that you're just powerless. And that kind of learned helplessness, I think is very destructive. And again, in this other ideology of blame the victim, you cannot do it alone. Institutions are important. And so in my free framework, I've chosen those institutions that I think are most central. And it's not just like random, like family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, in my view, those are the four core elements. I mean, you could talk about healthcare and housing, all those things, which are obviously important, but without those four, in my view, you don't get the sort of jumping off point that puts you in a situation that, um, that will allow you to succeed. So schools are a good example. A seven-year-old kid can't do anything if they're growing up in a neighborhood where there's no school choice and they, they, they only can go to the school where only 2% of kids are graduating from college. I'm graduating from high school ready for college. So that's, a, that's an institutional barrier that's real, right? So someone has to fix that. The seven-year-old can't do that themselves. But once that seven-year-old gets into school, the expectation has to be that you, you got to work your butt off. And not just because of systemic racism or some other, but just because life is not fair, life is hard, you've got to you know, do your best. So it's a combination of institution and individual. Does that help? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. You said earlier that one of your key pillars for how to raise children is religion. And if I understood you correctly, it seemed like you were saying that you want children to have some sort of abstract morality to help guide them so they don't have, they don't become some sort of nihilist, which I think most people would agree is totally inoffensive. But I think most people also, when they hear that a charter school is going to be run with religion as one of its guiding principles, they fear that that means it's going to be one particular religion, which um, might raise concerns. Now, my question is, how do you have any proposals or ideas for how to make religion an integral part of your educational framework while also keeping it secular? So the question is, when we talk about the free framework and the R for religion, does that start to get into to the territory of um, you know, teaching a specific religion. Um, and I think you said sort of abstract morality. Um, and so in a public school setting, this is a very important question. In a Catholic school, obviously, uh, you can be much more explicit. But in a public school setting, it's much more about um, helping young people understand the importance of what a faith commitment actually could mean in your life and what it has meant in the lives of literally billions of people. And that doesn't matter if it's Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, it doesn't, it, it only, so, so no, we're very explicitly not any singular religion, but the concept of a personal faith commitment is one that we just think more young people should know and understand. Again, it's your, it's your choice. At the end of the day, you can completely be an atheist or not, but I don't think most people, most young people ever have an opportunity to seriously grapple with what would that mean in my own life? You know, have they ever read Sermon on the Mount or any or any of the Quran or, or any other, um, you know, key readings that might inspire that interest in ways that I don't think is happening today. So I think it has to be in a quote unquote secular fashion. We're not prescribing for sure, 
but we want young people to know. I mean, I, I'm curious, how many people in this room would you describe you have a strong sort of spiritually religious commitment in your own life? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. When, and sometimes when I ask that question, by the way, in some rooms, there are kids who've come up to me afterwards and told me that they didn't want to raise their hand because they weren't sure they wanted to express that part of their identity publicly, which I find, find interesting. Hopefully there's no one like that in this room. Um, going back about talking about the religious part, how do you approach students that have gone through serious religious trauma through the institutions they were raised with? Uh, how do we go about it? Well, again, we're, um, first of all, I, I, I think in every situation, I mean, the other thing, for example, our schools are going to be um, committed to is this idea of democratic discourse and viewpoint diversity and not this idea that um, you can't talk about something. So it's probably a situation where I, I would want a teacher to know, and, and probably in such an exercise, you probably want to even, just like I just asked, you know, because here, I mean, more than half the um, room said they've had some spiritual religious commitment. So that it's it's certainly important to uh, enough people in the room that as, as representative, it seems like it's an okay thing to talk about. If you then discover that someone has had a traumatic experience, I think you'd want to deal with that on a on a one on one basis. Why? But I wouldn't want that um, singular experience or even if it's others in the class to knock down the idea of talking about why a faith commitment still could be positive, even if someone had a traumatic experience. I think sometimes that's where we seem to go in our society today that individual experiences, absolute legitimate, tend to undermine potentially the legitimacy of an entire institution. And I think that that it's got to be something we grapple with. That look, <laughs> absolutely. If you look at religion in our country and religious institutions, they have certainly not always practiced what we would want them to do. Certainly not standing up for the morals we um, uphold, and that should be penalized. And you know, um, but it shouldn't, in my view, completely derail talking about the importance of the institution. And then again, ultimately, the person makes their choice. But we shouldn't, you know, absent the content from being spoken about. We have time for one more question, and then we can invite people down afterwards. Um, with this idea of free will, we really lead to what we, the choices we make really do help build who we become. Where do you think affirmative action plays a role in higher education? Wow. So the question is, with the, with the choice of free will and um, being able to make good choices, where does affirmative action come through in higher education? This is a particularly important topic because it is very, very likely that the Supreme Court within the next 12 months will rule uh, race-based affirmative action unconstitutional. Um, and that's, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and if you're not familiar, there are two cases, but the I think the one that will gain the more attention is the Harvard case, where if you haven't looked at the data, um, essentially Harvard has, um, they break all applications down into a ranking of one to 10, where if you're ranked in the top, you know, the top decile, if you're a black student, I think you had a 57% chance of getting it. Like it was very, very high. And, but if you were an Asian student, you, but with the same academics, but you, um, your chance of getting in is something like you're not until maybe like the sixth or seventh decile in terms of probability, right? M meaning that the data is pretty overwhelming that Harvard was discriminating in favor of black um, kids versus Asian kids, right? And, and look at the case, I may have the numbers slightly off, but the orders of magnitude are definitely of that um, nature. And, and then I think UNC is the other case. And, um, and ironically, it was like close to 25 years ago, well, close to 50 years ago, there was the initial Baki case in California that basically said schools could take race into account as a factor 
in determining college admissions. And that has generally be up, been upheld. And then about 25 years ago, there was, a, I think, a case in Michigan, a law school, where a white um, uh, student was rejected and said that she was accepted, she was rejected based on the, the school's affirmative action policies. And the Supreme Court upheld that case in favor of the school. But Sandra Day O'Connor said, you know, guys, we've made some progress. Within the next 25 years, um, we should basically no longer need race-based affirmative action. Well, we're coming upon race-based, we're coming upon those 25 years now. And this case, by all accounts, is going to eliminate it. And I just did a, a podcast actually with the New York Times on this topic where I basically argued we should celebrate the progress that race-based affirmative action has made in our country. I mean, even in this room, you know, it's it's um. It, it, in, in many ways, I think it has been successful. Um, there are other ways in which it's created a perception. Well, maybe the only reason you're here is because you're a minority. You know, so there's, there's these trade-offs. I argued that if we're gonna have affirmative action, it should be much more economics-based, much more class-based than race-based. Because if you look at the data in a place like Harvard, the black students that are getting in, like 60 to 70% of them are middle or upper class or first generation immigrants who are, you know, the, the kids that are getting in based on the data are kids who probably would get in, the black kids that are getting in are probably kids that would get in anyway, you know, under a, just a more egalitarian system. Um, and so, because that's probably, the, the types of kids that are getting in are probably not the ones that were originally thought about when a race-based affirmative action was designed. So I think as it relates to agency and free will, I'll just keep coming back to the central point, which is, to me, we can't rely on affirmative action at higher ed to solve the problems of representation and all these other elements of society. When coming out of K to 12, we still don't have enough kids who are even reading at grade level. So it's important, but for me, the free will opportunities are forged much earlier, or lack of opportunities are forged much earlier. And that's why I stress so much parental choice in education, stronger K-12 schools, because I want everyone to be able to compete when we're applying um, to colleges. Thank you. Right. I'd like to thank Mr. Rowe and Mr. Cox for joining us today for this hour. And I would like to thank all of you for attending our annual Dean's Diversity Forum. It's a pleasure to have you here with us um, on campus and those of you who joined us on Zoom as well. Thank you for your attendance and thank you to all of our speakers today. Travel safe.